So, welcome back to the podcast. I know it's been quite a while. Um, it's taken a little bit longer than I expected to edit this, but here we are. Before I even start talking about what this episode entails, I just want to point out that there were some audio issues with this episode. So I've had to use some AI. Ooh, fancy. So I've had to use some AI to kind of tidy it up. So if you hear any kind of weird things, that's the AI trying to enhance the audio. So please just kind of gloss over that. Hopefully it's not too distracting. In today's episode, we have a lovely chap called James Harris, who's kind of Bristol-based. Uh, we talk about the decimal video that he made, why it took 15 years to make, it, uh, being a father, kind of the clickiness of Bristol and a bunch of other stuff. So hopefully you enjoy it. Good to finally chat to you. Yeah, you too. I've, I've been looking forward to this for the last couple of days. Yeah, I'm look, I've been a bit nervous, I'm not going to lie. Really? Yeah, for some reason, like tech stuff is always so easy because you can like go through and you know, edit, edit, edit bits, but yeah. So yeah, thanks for doing this. I do appreciate but, it. Yeah. Um, Hopefully I don't take up too much of your time. There seems to be an ongoing thing where these things take like three and a half hours. So no, just... no, no, it's all good. Bex has put in Vinny to Ben, so I'm free. Lovely stuff. Okay. So usually my first question is like, what got you into filming and stuff like that? But I want to change things up a bit. I've actually got an inquiry. Cool. So I noticed in your series, Community, that came out on Sidewalk, that yeah. some of your audio on the BX was set to manual instead of auto. Now, I've noticed yeah. Jason Hernandez does that, and I just want to know why you did that. Was there a reason, or was it like a mistake or something? It just, I, I think I was like, so in, in work, you know, like, we're always quite conscious about peaking and all this kind of stuff, and like having like the control over everything. everything. And I remember like I, I first got, I bought my, I bought two VX 1000s from Brownie directly after Little Paradise, I remember the moment I bought them, and it was when I went to see the state free premiere, and uh, that was at some pub in Bristol. And, and after seeing that, I was like, I need to get back. Like, I need to go back to a VX again because I had like two VX two thousands back in the day, and, and a VX two thousand one hundred. Never had a VX one thousand, and uh, yeah, I went back to that, and, and then was just like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do all these tests, and I'll. I'll I'll get people to you know at the park or like you know at street spot and just test the audio and make sure it's not 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 peaking and we just like find that uh I forget I haven't used a VX in in years but it it was like four or whatever I forget what what exact I, I had a few like settings for long lens and a few from for fisheye and then like chatting to James Whitlock as well he had, he has like, the same same deal with his VXs yeah I, it would just it's not because the VX on auto doesn't sound great because it does. Yeah. Purely just me being a bit of a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> but I think with those cameras as well, I, I've noticed it with the um, the Panasonics, is that it will say that it's clipping, but then you go in the edit and you, and it's never actually, you know, I think it's got like a little limiter on it. So I, it maybe it's the same way with like the VX. Like it may say it's clipping, but in fact, it's got like its own little automatic limiter on it or something like that. It's, it, it's funny that you, you've picked up on that because no one else has. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, that's just... You and Tidy Mike know that, actually. Tidy Mike, I had a conversation with Tidy Mike about that. I just, I don't know. I was like, I think it's just, you can... Maybe it's because I'm, like, uber nerdy when it comes to this sort of thing. Like, for me, sometimes I can't tell what a camera is by the video or the visual side of it, but if it's got, like, a normal built-in mic, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that, you know. So I could tell, I was like, that sounds like a VX on manual, which is yeah. weird. Maybe a bit what's too also, nerdy. What's also interesting about those videos are those videos, those those are probably the most I've ever been paid for skate filming. Interesting. I was like at the decline of Sidewalk, and they ah. paid me very well for those those edits. Did you was... kill Sidewalk then? <laughs> oh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks to Ben and Rye for that. For, yeah, cooking that the homies. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. So you're actually paid for those videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was um. I forget what what was going on at the time, but I was kind of just like I'd finished Little Paradise, and I wasn't ready to commit, or wasn't kind of thinking about a full length at that point. It just was like, oh, I've got I got myself back into VX stuff, and I want to do stuff that isn't really really quick turnaround, but stuff that doesn't take ages. And yeah, kind of pitched the idea of doing a, a short series, and then um, no, I, th I forget, I, I might have wanted to do a third, but that was past the point of Sidewalk. 
in the ground at that point. But yeah, that was that was the idea. So a, a series kind of like um, Mike Arnold did one as well. The yes. height stuff. Yeah, it, it was similar vein basically. If you don't mind me asking, um, how much were you actually paid to make those? Uh, I, th- I think it was like three, five, maybe like between two and four hundred per, per per edit or something. Wow, well, not loads, but you know what I mean. Like, like in in skateboard I, tubs, it's like it's like wow, you've been paid money. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, McGee once telling me that I was probably one of the only people in the UK that got paid to make a shop video, which I don't know if yeah, I should be yeah, proud I about. Mean, yeah, I mean, so it's it's very rare. I mean, Gaz, we had a conversation about this one. I did the decimal video, and uh, it was one of those subjects I didn't want to didn't want to have the conversation with him. But it was he was just like, yeah, I've been wanting to have this chat with you as well, so. I want to pay you for it, but how can we work this out, kind of thing? So we, yeah, yeah, was, yeah Gaz is an, an absolute wonderful human being. So that was like not a hard conversation to have at all. But of course, yeah. I think uh, actually that, that kind of break brings up something that I'm going to talk with um, Shane Auckland hopefully next week about. Like we're going to talk oh, about sweet. like filmers' rights and you know kind of representing yourself and that kind yeah. of thing. I think it is important to like be comfortable talking about like getting paid for your work or some sort of yeah, kind of thing set up where you can get compensated for the time you put into it. And I think it's cool to uh I think I think it's important for younger people to find out about that anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that's that's one of like when when we get into skate filming, we we do it because we love it. And also when you when you um realise that when you've got friends that are sponsored, you can kind of piggyback onto the, onto that and then get free stuff. And then you keep going, and then you think this might lead somewhere. This might lead somewhere, and then you quickly realise, kind of being taken for a ride, uh, and then you never get what your what you what your worth is. But you know, you're not like oh, uh, so my my windows need replacing. Uh, so I'll tell my friends that you're a really good job at replacing my windows, but I won't pay you for you know replacing my windows. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like my boss says that all the times like you know creators the creative industry is so like undervalued nowadays like you wouldn't ask a plumber to, to fix your sink for free so that it's the same with skateboarding as well yeah absolutely and at the end of the day it's it's um promotional marketing and, and I, I think i forget when i saw it the other day but it was like the professional skateboarders I, I hate fucking hate this term, but like they are some of the most early influencers. Like a name is on a board, you're gonna buy Heath Kirchart board. Yeah, yeah, that's actually. Oh man, I don't like thinking about that. That's kind of. Right. <laughs> oh man, I've never thought about that like that before. Yeah, the pressing book. <laughs> right, so I'm gonna read you a quote from an article, and I want you to react to it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Tonight, in my best Radio 1 voice, tonight, Bristol skateboarders unite for the premiere of James Harris's Bristol skate scene film, Prism. The film features a long list of Bristol-based skaters showcasing the best local talent. If you want to get involved in the party, which also doubles as the first birthday celebrations for local skate shop at the park, then make your way to the Cube Cinema tonight at 7. So, was Prism your first full length? Well, yeah, you've, you've gone deep there. Yeah, I made that when <laughs> I was... 18 seven, I think I started filming that when I was like 17 and it might have come out when I was like 18 or 19 or something and the park was a little it was a skate shop that my friend Matt Warren started up um St George's kind of like it, it's just outside of Bristol like that's at the center of Bristol um but you still get kind of like a catchment area for central Bristol skateboarders because of the St George skate park but it was kind of it's kind of like a similar era to Dean Lane skate park um there's some pretty awesome tricks of Habgood skateboarding there anyway yeah so prism um that was kind of like my first proper video where i was where i picked up a, a vx got it fourth hand or whatever and it was mainly close friends but then it also had some people in it that were you know, pretty good like um i started to hook up with nikki howells quite a lot during the filming of that and andy coleman dave snadden uh yeah a few people that are obviously like big names um but that was me kind of like getting my foot in the door with the Bristol skate scene, making friends with everyone, and it was essentially a love letter to Alien Workshop. Like, if, uh, I, I don't even have a copy of it. I, I've, I've not seen it in so long, but... um, I was about to say, like, I can't find it on, like, YouTube or anything. Yeah, it was on Empora. I think it was, like, Sidewalk Empora or something. Obviously, that's long gone. That's a, that's a, that's a throwback right there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, I don't know. I, I've not, I had no idea about aspect ratios or anything, so I think it's, like... 
I, I, I don't know. It, I think it's like 69, even though it should be 4-3 or something as well. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I was quite proud of some of the stuff, some of the way that I, the way I cut some of that. And it was like before I knew any, anything about color correction or like or grading or whatever. But yeah, I remember being quite proud of the way that I was put together. And I, I bit Alien Workshop hard. I mean, I saw the cover because it's on Skate Video sites somehow. Like they have a cover at like, yeah, the cover yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They asked me about the soundtrack for that because the soundtrack oh. was all from like Southwest Skateboarders and stuff. They gave me tracks. Oh, cool. So, well, yeah. But I was going to say, like, the, the cover's, like, very workshop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, I was like, is this, like, a web edit or something? I was like, no, it's, like, a full edit. Like, oh, fuck, that's kind of sick. So you don't have a copy of it? No, I don't have a copy, no. I, I'm, I, I've got copies of everything else that I've done, but it, I, I did have it. It must have got lost in, like, a house move or something, but, um, oh. yeah, I don't know. But I, I only made, like, 100 DVDs or something. Did you sell them all? Yeah, I think so. Lost Art had a few. I remember that. Mackie, yeah, bought some of me. Nice. And with like the back of it, I did a um, a venture edit and then a big push. One of the, like the the second Shiner big push or something, uh, and did like a, a, like had a few copies with me. It was like handing them out to shops. Be you know, like, hey, can you watch my video, please? Oh man, I I feel like I was doing the same thing when I was like fourteen when I put like my first little full length, if you want to even yeah. call it that, out, and I was like taking it to the guys who I like, ran the local skate. I was like, can you tell me what you think? That kind of thing. I felt so nervous. I'm sure you. I'm guessing you were the same. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember uh, Jackie slash Dave, what you want to call him from Native, kind of looking at me, be like, oh, I'm not sure about that, and my heart obviously sunk. But um, past that point, we got to know each other really, really well. So it was it was like a breaking the ice kind of thing. But also, if you don't make those decisions or make mistakes, you never learn and you never progress. And if you don't take criticism on the gin or like learn from that, you're never going to develop. So those kind of those things are essential for like a, for a filmmaker in general. Of course. Yeah. I, I, actually, talking of criticism, I was talking uh, in the well previous episode of this, I was talking with Pedro about like how I feel like the new generation of filmers do need to learn how to take constructive criticism yeah. and learn how to like improve themselves because I feel like any time I've been asked to kind of give comment on like a video from someone like in my Instagram DMs or something I'll be like you know maybe you could have filmed that a bit differently or it's a bit too loud here or there some people don't like that they just don't like it and it's like Wait. well what can I do to help you yeah I don't know maybe I'm like stepping out, out of line here but like was it an overnight not on overnight, was it kind of something that you had to learn taking like kind of that kind of constructive criticism when you were coming up as a filmer? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, also, the, to kind of sidestep a little bit, but I'll go back on track. Um, when I was, when I made that video, I was in my late teens and then I was also at uni at that point. And when I started uni, I started to learn on DB tape. And then from there, it was like the Sony SXD stuff and then it was ssd and it was p2 so within that like three year period i went from just kind of like navigating all these different formats and getting my head around everything and from that it was it's like a bit of confusion as to what direction you should go in and then the the skateboard landscape is changing with obviously fully flared and pretty sweet and everything at that point so everyone's kind of like oh where's vx where's hd DVD, like digital, all this kind of stuff. So you can like yeah. thrown in. So criticism also in that mix, you're kind of like, well, I'm taking all this stuff on board, but I'm I'm trying to improve myself and figure out the style and direction I go in, which off the to kind of like fast forward a bit off the back of Prism, I was kind of like, uh, I I did a a few big pushes, like did the Shine a big push and the the Osiris big push. And then from that, I was like, "Well, I quite like HD stuff, and it's and it's quite easy to ingest and and to to grade." I was like getting into kind of grading and stuff at that point. So I thought I could uh, make a film in HD at, at that point, and basically had a had an, uh, an idea and and a style I wanted to go in. And then off the back of the Osiris Big Push, other people kind of like wanted to get on get on board, and it went on a completely different tra trajectory. Which again, the end product, I'm definitely not happy with and that was perfect cruise however from that it it was distributed by keen and and from that like mike at keen took a, a massive risk on that because he saw me do stuff for passport um with phil parker did some stuff i forget i think it's whole of community i had some footage in that edit uh, and he he believed in he believed in what i was doing 
in, in pushing scenes and I was getting more connections with people that were sponsored and that kind of thing. And it, it got given away quite he- quite a lot with, uh, I think it was like every order with Rue 1, you got a free copy of it or something. Wow. Um, and and, it, and it, yeah, it's, it sold. And then from that, it was like, okay, cool. I made, an, I made a, a video which has done quite well. I'm in like my early 20s. I'm not happy with it because of the direction it's gone in, but I need to make something I'm actually proud of. And then from Perfect Blues, for about two and a half years, I think, I was just doing stuff for Shiner, like their web, their web edits, kind of just like helping Alan Glass, like just do stuff together with the Pixels or like we went and did trips for various different brands, like doing footage for that. I wasn't doing anything for myself. So I was like, un- I was unfulfilled in my like personal project stuff, but I was still getting to go out and meet new people and, and get in the mix with a lot of really lovely yeah, people and brands and stuff. But then one little paradise kind of when that started to become a reality. I was like, right, I'm going to give this 110% off the back of the last two videos. Like Prism was like the stepping stone. Perfect Blues was the the mistake. And then Little Paradise to me was like, I need to make something that I'm really proud of, which which I, I, I think I did. That sounds like a real good, like personal growth kind of thing. You know, you yeah. kind of had your high kind of first shot at it, does quite well, then kind of, you know, you start getting a little bit older and you kind of learn more about like the industry and like you have to do things you may not want to necessarily do or you don't believe in or whatever it might be. Yeah. And then that kind of energy almost, like that kind of drive to like, right, I really want to like do something that I am happy to put my name on at the end of. I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about videos for me is that, like, uh, same as you, we, we come from an era where having a physical copy of something is incredibly important. I mean, just for ourselves, really. If even one person picks that up and they feel the same way that we did about videos like Lost and Found or uh, Minefield or like the, the, the static videos or whatever, you know, if if, a, if someone picks that up and it affects them in the same way that the, the videos that we grew up with affected us, then that's a win. I mean, I still get people that were like, perfect blues, I picked this up when I bought my first board or whatever, this is great. I mean, that's the thing on paper, perfect blues did very well but for me it really didn't do well it was an absolute mess but yeah little paradise came along and that was distributed by rock solid and uh wes was yeah wonderful throughout that whole point whole process and i think yeah dc and it was a tail end of like a third foot's life they sponsored that as well yes that was really good times that was like a two and a half year process making that video because i wanted to just like curate it and and as i was making that initially it was just going to be nikki andy Snads and who else was it? Jess Young and then Manhead and uh, Ryan Price got involved and then like had a, like a from the section stuff in that, which um, yeah, Sidewalk did a piece on it and the, the, there were the photos in that every Sidewalk basically during that during that period that had photos from the the, the film sheets, which is really cool. That's kind of nice. Um, sounds like you had a bit more of a a crew you were happy with. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and everyone really backed the the vision of it. And that's like vital, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. it. Yeah, it had a um a much more like a um a me feel to it. Like if if you if you watched if you managed to find perfect blues anyway, you you can kind of see that that's like. I was about to say then, it's like, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> I think uh, I mean it might be on YouTube. Maybe I didn't look hard enough. I'm not it sure. Might, I think it might be on the Pixels Vimeo. I think it might be on that actually. A few parts. That's also the, a throwback. Yeah. yeah. We're going, to, we're going to like 2012 era skateboard media yeah, online. Are, yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's yeah. What, wait, 11 years ago. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> the age just sinks in. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, I haven't thought about pixels in probably five years. Maybe it was good fun doing that. Yeah, it's good. It was a cool website. I thought it was like a fresh, I hate that word, fresh take on like skateboarding content. Also, awful word. Ugh. I remember when I talk to you probably like i don't know a year or so ago on instagram and i think you'd mentioned that oh, I'd, I'd seen a photo or something and you were using a black magic yeah yeah and i and i just wanted to ask so like from what i gathered from like the videos i've seen you've had you went from a vx to a 60d back to a vx and then black magic or have i got that in the wrong order i think so perfect blues no sorry prism was vx 2000 Perfect Blues was HVX 
200 and an HMC 151. And then Little Paradise was a 60D and a bit of HMC. And then after that, it was VX1 for, I don't know, maybe three years or something, maybe a bit more. And then, yeah. And then it was, yeah, Black Magic Pocket 6K. That's quite uh, an eclectic collection right there. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I feel like with the people I've spoken to, it's like it's usually like VX, HVX, and then that's it. So I like the fact that you've actually dabbled with all the different kind yeah. of styles of camera. You've got your DSLR, your DV cameras, you've got your HD P2 ones, mm-hmm. and then your pocket cinema camera, which I think is yeah. pretty cool. So I got asked, like, what drove you to the Black Magic instead of like sticking with like a staple like HVX or a HPX or something like mm. that. So I I finished my I was I was working for a cancer journal up to 2018. Then yeah, our son was born in 2018. At that point I was like I can't really continue with this job. It was just like supporting my family. It just wasn't like doing doing it. So I ended up getting um, my current job, which I'm still at now, um the uh, creative agency called Harley's which is based just outside Bristol. And all the stuff they use is black magic. So you've got bursas, pockets, the they had a few of the old style, like the cinema four K cameras, the like the cube things. Oh, the box with the terrible screen. That's it, yeah, with the terrible <laughs> screen. But the yeah, the, the peaking was just all over the place. Um yeah. We did a shoot in Australia and we're shooting this like really cool car stuff. And I managed to pick up but we were hiring a pocket six K there for like for some in car stuff. I was like, do you know what? This would be great for skateboarding. And the battery life was awful on it because it just uses like the Canon LP batteries. Oh my God, yeah. They last like 30 minutes on it. So I was like doing my research. Can I keep this on an easy handle and then get a rig to power it? So I managed to work out that I could get an adapter into an NPF plate to use the big NPF Sony batteries, like three, four hour battery life. And then you could still like get in the, the mic, the monitor on the top of the easy handle and it and it behaves kind of the same kind of weight as a uh, well it's it's better than the better better weight distribution than the dslr would be on a pop on the easy handle but not quite as perfect as a, as a vx1 but it's yeah. pretty good feeling yeah yeah i just i use um the 6ks at work and the the amount of rigging we've had to do to kind of get it to like an eng style kind of shoulder yeah. mount thing oh <laughs> it's like it's a beautiful camera the images it produces are yeah. bar none like for the price incredible camera but like i think skating it makes sense because like especially with the way you've rigged it out with that easy handle and all mm. the accessories and stuff but for like ru- ru- uh, ru- run and gun documentary style that we do at work with that camera such a faff but the yeah, pictures yeah. man the pictures oh, they're so good <laughs> i mean uh, what do you say do you shoot pro res or do you shoot b raw then uh pro res Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's just like a, kind of a, again almost like taking influence from from my day job, where we get where we get projects that might end up being like ProRes being like seven terabytes or something, and you think to yourself, well, you've got a scenario where you've got I don't know like thirteen texts or something, and it's all slated and everything. But with skateboarding, you don't know how many times it's going to take. So I need to be economical with the format. So yeah. I just shoot ProRes, and then um, yeah, it was like mark mark all the takes. I've got, I don't know how many terabytes worth of cars I've got in my bag or something, but yeah, just enough memory to, to see me through it for the day. Because if you were to shoot, shoot B-roll, then it'd be a, yeah, just an insane amount of data. Yeah. Are you shooting to the CFast cars or are you using the uh, the T5s? Uh, neither. The S- SD. With the, um, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't expect that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's living life on the edge. <laughs> yeah. I did think about the T5, but just the amount of room that I need on the easy handle for everything else, I was like, well, that's not going to work. And I didn't really fancy the Velcro to the side. It just seemed a bit um, C fast cards. I did the comparisons between like the best possible SD card and the C fast. And I just thought I can get way more for my money with the best possible SD card. And managed to get a load of Lexar. I've got like a, yeah, a couple of terabytes worth of Lexar SD cards. Okay, that's yeah, fair. they've never they've not failed on me. So okay. I mean, if you are shooting ProRes, it's not as bad as like raw then no. i think you would need the t5 yeah yeah talking of them um, like weight distribution as well you mentioned like using the mpf kind of adapter or the, you know adapting the battery or whatever have you thought about maybe going from the the, the mini xlr power cable or whatever it is and then putting like a v-lock on the back interesting that would like 
balance it out quite well, I think. Yeah, I guess, I guess it must... You know, the Vlogs, the smallest... Well, sorry, Mr. Sunshine. You probably want... I'll, I'll be back in a sec. Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. All good in the hood? Yeah, I've just... I've, I've worn the bin out. I went to um to Bath Park with him today, to the, to the skate park. Well, not... We, we didn't skate anything. But, um, uh, okay. You know, I've kind of worn him out today, and he's like... He wouldn't, he wouldn't go, he's not climbing up the stairs to go to bed. Uh, and yeah, Bex is like, uh, she is seven and a half months pregnant now. So she's pretty, yeah, we've got our second on the way in like. Congratulations. Eight, so, so she can't really cl- carry up the stairs. He's uh, like, yeah. He, he's a fight, you know, ne- nearly five. So he's not exactly light. Sorry, I forgot where we were. Uh, we've what were we talking about. Uh, v-log, yeah, the, V-log, V-Log batteries. Yeah. Yes. So I think maybe with the easy handle, it might be a bit, bit back heavy. I guess it might depends on the lens you've got on the front. It, I guess it depends on where you put the V-Lock as well. Because in my mind, it makes sense kind of strapped to the back. Yeah. Although, hmm, strapped to the back, it might work, yeah. Because the nice thing is the, the touchscreen and, and like, you know, getting your hand inside the easy hand or whatever else. Um, maybe underneath? Or is that like too much? Uh, underneath, there's... Or would you lose a tripod, friends? You would lose one. I mean, that might work, yeah. Mm. It's always a good, at least it's always a possibility. Yeah. Do you zoom in when you're doing like long lens, or do you just like keep it static and then zoom in post? Yeah, yeah. So um, I've I've got a one of the Canon 24 25 lenses, the the original the Mark One, and yeah, like a, a subtle zoom in on zoom with that, and then yeah, with with the decimal video, I shot everything in 4K and then edited in 1080 because we we knew we wanted to make it hard copy. So it's like, well, it's going to be a USB or it's going to be DVD. So just kind of, yeah, put, put the 4K stuff in the 1080 timeline. And that obviously had like way more resolution to play with. And then the 1080, if untouched, just looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, talking of um, like hard copies and stuff like that, I remember on the um, Slap forums, I think I brought it up there, where it was like, it would almost be something that you could charge more for if you saw like, talking of like USB sticks, maybe sell like... 128 gigabyte USB stick and then put like an uncompressed copy on it, you know, like the yeah. full fat, you know I'd love that, I don't know, is that even really feasible these days do you think? Or? No, fully, because the way that you master a, a USB stick it, you, I mean, I I would get any size USB stick um, and then put the copies on, they have to be X fat and an MP4 so that they're readable across all platforms and TVs and whatever else so as, as long as you've got something that's readable by everything. I mean, obviously, if you're putting into a, just a computer solely, you could do whatever you wanted, but you just tell the USB people how big the rod needs to be and the the type you want, and, and they'll do it. So, yeah, fully feasible. But the, the issue is it's so bloody expensive. Is it really? Yeah. So, like, the decimal video, for example, they retailed for, I think it was, like, eight or nine pounds or something, and... Yeah, to get them manufactured and those USB cards and stuff, I think it was like four or five pounds or something each. So, like straight away, you, you yeah, you need you need to um, it, it seems quite a lot compared to DVD or whatever for the for the scale of it. Yeah, um, and obviously you don't get a buffer or a cover or anything. And mm. for example, like Little Paradise, that retailed for four pounds, and that was like ninety three p to get a gatefold and and you know booklet style DVD kind of thing done. Obviously, from mediums, but um, so how I'm trying to work out in my head. So, how many would you need to sell to make a profit at that point? I think that's so. I mean, D, yeah, the little Paradise DVDs. It was it was pretty easy to to sell enough to make a profit. I think we got like three thousand made of those. But the decimal video, obviously, the landscape of hard copy media being completely different. Even though it was that's like a five year gap, um, we made. 500 copies of those and I think sold like 400, 350, 400 or something and the rest have kind of been given away with orders and whatever else. It's just interesting like the 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 world we're in now obviously trying to sell a full length, especially a hard copy just like compared to how it was 15, 20 years ago you know, pre-YouTube and all that stuff it's just interesting to see because I, I mean, I don't, at the moment the people I've spoken to I don't think they've actually done physical copy so you're the first that i've spoken to for this podcast anyway that has actually done like dvds and stuff like that in the last couple of years and it's just interesting to kind of find out how what has the process changed is it more expensive or you know like how does it work for you like is it a 
is it because you want it to be on a physical thing for people to keep or is it because culture thing you know it's important to keep physical medium alive or is it more like well it's you know might as well do you get what i'm coming from mm-hmm. yeah of course uh, i think that when well my first yeah with prism and perfect blues pr- prism especially that was um of the time where everything was dvd it didn't really matter of, of whether it was um kind of had it and had enough worth to be on a dvd or not you kind of just did it because that was the norm and not much stuff was going online at that at that point perfect blues was the um yeah 2011 2012 so that was kind of like a, the um the experimental period of like where we where we go from here little paradise i i knew i wanted to make that on a dvd because of the way i felt about it and um the people involved and obviously because we had sponsors it's nice for everyone to see something physical and then off off, off the back of that there was the sidewalk article there was a, a third foot did a limited run of boards with a little paradise on it so it was, it was nice to have like a things physical to to show people what we'd made and that we we're really proud of and then with Corinium, the decimal video gaz has been trying for the last 16 years to make a skate video so for he's been he's asked aside from me four other filmers to make a wow. video and i remember in 2009 when i was making prism the first decimal skate shop video trailer came out and andy coleman's footage in prism was meant to be for the decimal video which never happened and then for years and years and years it'd be like various people would start it for a month or two and then just lose interest or like people would quit the shop team and then there was like a stagnant period where no one was really skating for decimal apart from a few people that have been on the shop since day one and then it kind of got to a stage where i i'd finished working on a, a load of videos with scott whitaker and tom gill and uh, ricardo we all skate for decimal and it, we we're kind of just like speaking about what we we're going to do next because i'd finished an edit called daylight which i did with i think i released that with vague was that your last vx edit yes it was yeah and and, and yeah it was just like well if i'm going to do a, a decimal video i've known gaz since i started filming skateboarding and I, lo- I love him to bits and this video obviously means so much to him and in turn means so much to me and there's some people in, the, in that video that have been skateboarding forever, like Scott Whitaker, he's been in all the old Unabomber videos. Tom Gill, he's been on Decimal since day one. Uh, Andy Coleman, he's a pretty like household name in UK skateboarding. So you've got all these people that are well known, but you've got some people that have never even been filmed before. Some people who have never even experienced what it's like to go on a skate mission and, and to film tricks. Yeah. So to have all of that wrapped in a, a physical thing for them to show was like it was really important for everyone and it came out at a perfect time um i had no real kind of like deadline of when i wanted to finish it but it just kind of organically finished around christmas time so it was like okay cool christmas presents <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't realize it had such a um like a difficult production like that's, yeah that's yeah. essentially like a 15 year kind of attempt it was yeah to make and, the video and if you watch the video at the, at the end of the last trick you've got this kind of like it, it, the video itself is is a love letter to Sirens to Sirens Hester, which is where Decimal's based. Yeah, you know, I I did a quite a big hunt into like archive um, British cinema stuff and and found this old VHS stuff that was all about Cotswolds and Western. Oh, the stuff that begins it as well. Exactly. Yeah. Love so, that. So you got the yeah this uh, VHS kind of style stuff, and then then that that kind of the the screen widens to the present day, and then at the end it, it goes back to the four three the VHS stuff, which also looks exactly like the first ever footage that was shot for the decimal video so arthur loveday who now does some incredible cinema work in london he was working on the first ever decimal video but um, managed to get all this old archival material 90 percent of it has never been seen before and that's the credit stuff wow but all this stuff is very circular so all the stuff that was meant to be this decimal video the first time has made it it, it has been made you know that's really cool yeah Wow. So there is, I'm, I'm assuming there's probably like a whole bunch of stuff that didn't even get used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, yeah, there's a lot of footage that I've, that I've still got from that era that, yeah, it's never been used for, for various reasons. Just like the quality's not like great or like there was a falling out with someone over some uh, oddy shit. The politics. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically. But oh, but also that, yeah, kind of like to put more weight on that video for me, It that was some... Um, I wanted to make sure that I was making something that felt right 
and had no fat on it whatsoever. So I, I managed to speak to McGee and Kev Parrott and they both agreed to basically help me through the edit process. So I was sending them drafts like every few weeks or whatever and they'd give me a lot of feedback. McGee was pretty instrumental in the intro and how I present that and like the the animated type for, like font and stuff and and how we make it feel special. And Kev was again like quite instrumental in being like cut this quicker you know like i'm not sure whether this works because it's not been treated in this way so like all the stuff that's got a slightly different grade or a slightly different feel there are certain shots in it where i hadn't thought to myself because when you're so deep into an edit you kind of can't see that it's like tunnel vision exactly yeah that's it yeah it was really helpful in um helping me realize what needs to feel like more b-roll kind of vibe or stuff that needs to have more weight in terms of like an emotional moment yeah um uh, and the length of it as well. Like, uh, it was just like trimming it down, trimming it down, trimming it down. And to me, I was like, does a 17 minute video really need to be hard copy? But then it's like, no, it does. Absolutely. I think if it was like 10 minutes, then maybe. Yeah, exactly. Because there's like a, you know, there's so much space on that disc at that point. You might as well fill it up with some yeah, stuff. That's it. Yeah, I mean, the, the bonus stuff, there was like a, a skate park edit that we did for Skateboarders Companion on there. And there's all the uh, off cuts, which I think is like 20 minutes or half an hour stuff. Mm-hmm. And then all of the, VX footage that I shot of all the decimal people into one into one edit. I just wish Blu-rays were still kind of. I, I've talked about this before as well. It's like I just wish Blu-rays were like easier to make. You yeah, know? yeah. Like because it would have looked amazing on a Blu-ray. That's the thing as well. It, uh, I I kind of look at um, a DVD show and and you think okay, what what am I going to watch tonight? What am I going to pick? What am I going to pick to watch? Yeah. And like you said, Blu-ray, DVD, and all that kind of stuff. You see the cover, you see the spine, you know exactly what. Like what it is. Like even with the thinner gatefold, the card DVDs, like the habitat videos or whatever. You know what it is, you can see that. But with the USB thing, like I've got mine in my wallet. It's like a um <laughs> just because it's the credit card size. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, if anyone asks about it, I can just whip it out and be like, hey, watch this. But, but another reason why I kind of did the USB gate USB card for Corinium was the cover version video. I just thought it was so uh, cool. Never seen anything like that before. That is clever. Yeah. God, that's such a good video. Yeah. Damn. So I, I should try of... and get McGee on here. Yeah, you should. Yeah, him or Kev, him or Kev. I think that'd be a great fucking episode. Yeah, yeah. God, I, got, I bet they've got stories. So, did Gaz like the edit? Then you know, what did he think when he first saw it? So I showed them. I showed. I went to the pub with Gaz and Ricky. Went to Sirencester about two or three months before we kind of scheduled the premiere in because we wanted to kind of we we knew that it was like nearing the end of it. And I said, I've got a pretty good nearly finished rough cut ish kind of thing and yeah we sat down in siren Chester in this i think it was the crown pub gaz had hired out the the back room so we could just go there privately and sit down and watch it <laughs> and as soon as he finished he turned to me ricky and his face was, was like red tears streaming down his face wow i was like oh <laughs> <laughs> so i'll assume Good. Yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, even when, and then that emotion to him, because he's been wanting to do that for so long. And he's seeing that, like, actually get realized also with some people that he's been, been wanting to get in a video since the day that he opened the shop. And then there's, a, there's a, I think it's on the Decimal Instagram and my Instagram, uh, there's the the speech that we gave before the video. And I'd, I'd lost my voice or something, and I can't really talk that well. And Gaz is crying before we, before we showed the film. It's like, Heartbreak. So much emotion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all for it, though. I mean, that sounds pretty beautiful, actually. Yeah, it was, yeah. It yeah, fucked being like a manly man. I was trying to make it cool. You know, nah, just... yeah. Get it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this isn't really a question. I just wanted to say that... Did you edit the retrospective? Retrospective. The um, decimal retrospective. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. I was just going to say, because that was fucking sick. <laughs> like, rewatched it again this morning. It's like, ooh. I was just going to say, like, especially at that, the second half, at about the three minutes first, say, what? There's <laughs> some really good shit. That was, is that the stuff with, oh, like, Scott's, like, nose grind on, back heel and stuff in that? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah I did that, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was, was sorry. thanks. That, that was on the USB as a bonus as well. Oh, okay. I, I did have a job for, like, the longest time, and all these videos would come as, I really want it. <laughs> like, I'll, 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 I'll send you one. I'll, I'll, I'll what? Got a few. No, you don't have to do that. No, is it still yeah. a... I'm not going to take, you You know, come on, I've got to pay for it. You put your back into it. I'm not going to just take it for free. No, I don't even, even know if Gaz has got any copies left, so I'll, 
I'll, I'll send you one. Yeah, I'm sure I've got another one. Yeah, a few lying around. Thank you. I appreciate it. I suppose we should talk a little bit about like Bristol skate culture, shouldn't we? Cool. Yeah, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Unfortunately, I'm a bit ignorant of it. Like, I know of Lloyd's and kind of, you know, 50-50 and all that kind of stuff, but I, I might have to get you to talk about it a little bit just because I'm, a bit, I, like I said, I'm a bit ignorant of it personally. Like, it's history cool. and stuff. Uh, it, it's quite interesting cause, be, because um, when I was, yeah, like growing up within almost skateboarding, I, I very much tried to integrate myself into the scene and then quickly realised that I am not a cool kid. I'm I'm not one I mean I'm not I'm not going to talk down on anyone um but but there's uh a, a, a thing there there are cliques within Bristol got to be careful with more words here where people come up, they're really trying so hard to be cool but it just makes them cold oh and I'm, I'm not one to be I I I love my friends and I love people and I I don't want to you know give people the hard shoulder just because they're not part of my clique or whatever I yeah, there were there were a few people that I aligned and I, I got really really close to in the Bristol scene, and we kind of we really did our own thing. We were own our own pocket of people, and you can see that within my videos. You see the same people pop up now and again, and and you realise that okay, I must have spent a lot of time with them, as opposed to to other other groups. So even now, even though I live in Bristol, um, I very rarely skate in Bristol. Oh wow! Um, I skate a lot of the outskirts and like doing. I, I still. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do more stuff at Desmall in my in my spare time, which kind of leads me to go to Gloucester, Swindon, Sarnchester, a bit of Bristol, like the outskirts, or whatever. Because the the team is spread so far, we kind of pick places where it's kind of easier for everyone to get to. So in terms of yeah, Bristol skate scene, I, I um yeah, there are, there are a few. A few spots that I frequented quite a lot, like the the classics like Lloyd's or Little Lloyd's, Connors Green, um, and and then finding spots. I mean, my my big draw from film and skateboarding, like everyone, is is finding places that have not been seen before. I like the idea of NBDs and like one upping people, but it doesn't interest me that much. I'd much rather see someone go to a place and for someone to look at that footage and think, where is that? I've not seen that before. That looks really interesting. Even if it's not an amazing spot or whatever, the look of the shot or like the architecture or the colours or whatever, you're like, that's cool. Or for something to have a story, like like everything's got yellow tiles or, or like green benches or something, like with the way you cut a video together. So yeah. for me, it's been the case that I, I really like in, in my day-to-day -day just going around the outskirts and finding places that no one's seen and capturing that. And then for people to be like, I know who shot that because that's you know James's spot. That that's my draw to to Bristol skateboarding basically. Um, as much as I love Lloyd's, you know, there's there's um, everyone's got their own take on it, but it does get a bit dull. But I mean, yeah, I'm sure people said that about like Love Park back in the day. You know, especially yeah. going there every day. Yeah, it's nice looking back from a um, yeah with with rose tinted glasses and and from a historical point of view, but. When you're kind of in it day to day, you think to yourself, "Oh, does do we really need to film another nose grind here? Like whatever." I think it's good that you've um, maybe not stepped back, but kind of taken the different route. I I see a lot of obviously everyone has their own path and their own has their own way of of navigating the the skateboard scene. But I see a lot of people that are, that are coming up in in like the younger films, even though I don't know them that well, they're really trying to be part of part of this central group. Which is awesome, but uh, for me, it's it's making sure you add a new and a fresh flavour to it, and your own vision. Like there's a um, a filmer and photographer called Tom Lee. His stuff is excellent. I feel like he he's really pushing the Bristol scene in a way that like that no one else has really done before. It it kind of reminds me of back in the day when you had George and Evan and Louis Gain. Their videos, the Bristol and Blue, it's absolutely fantastic. The the approach that they had on it, yeah, are really refreshing. Oh, that's, that kind of leads me on to my next question, which is like, who are some of your inspirations, you know, for like making skate videos? Who do you like look up to? I mean, ev everyone in the UK skateboard scene is, is going to say Dan McGee because that has that been the reoccurring best. theme. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's been really lovely is, is he's like helped me out a lot with with edits and like just being able to talk to him about stuff. Is like I, I appreciate it fully and I've yeah, got the utmost respect for him. And then you've got Ryan Gray. Kev Parrott, Ben Powell, James Willock. I I just his work has just been amazing. And he You've done a bit of work with him, haven't you? In the yeah, past. Yeah. 
Yeah. So he um he's got his believe it or not his first ever video is being released this year and it will be his last. It's called Sulis and um he he he's obviously did all the stuff with Norberg back in the day. Um but his first ever proper full length. I think he's been working on it for like 5 years. Wow. And every at the end of every year it's like, "Yes, yeah, coming out this year. It's coming out this year. It's coming out this year." But yeah, he um is that like a bit of a perfectionist kind of thing. Yeah, I think he struggled with motivation from from people as well. But yeah, I think it's going to be absolutely stunning when it comes out. Yeah, in terms first, of what's... first and last, first and last, yeah. Wow, that's something. Yeah, I think it'll be brilliant. Who else have we got? George Nevin. Um, he helped me out just a, an absolutely incredible amount when I was learning to film skateboarding, and was so kind to me and generous, and helped me out with equipment and just like tips and tricks. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be where I am today without George, really. So I, I owe him a lot. And then to bring up the the other side of filmmaking, you obviously got photographers and people that can help you out along the way with inspiration or like to look at things in a different way that a, that a film might. So Chris Johnson, I've spent a lot of time with him over the years and, and the way that he would look at things and his eye was just like, just gorgeous. So I've got, yeah, a, a lot to thank Chris for. Yeah, just taking us out on trips and then to spots and, and allowing me to look at things I haven't, I haven't thought of before, like textures and colours and being more careful about composition and like where things are in the frame and yeah. uh, pace and things like that. I mean, there's yeah, there's more to composition than just rule of thirds. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. You've got, you got your leading lines and all that kind of stuff. Right, you know. I, I, that's, that makes me think, Jack, but I feel like the um, British skate photographers don't get nearly enough credit. No, that's it. No, no, they don't. You know, like all the magazines, even just stuff that goes on the web and whatnot. And there are some amazing photographers that have come out of the UK over the last 20, 30 years. And I just feel yeah. like there's like not enough representation for them. Well, I think that the Skateboarders Companion do an excellent job yeah. of, of of lifting that and, and doing things that not a lot of magazines have done before. And that you've got the gallery in the magazine, but then you've also got the online stuff that gets pushed as well. The stuff that would have made it into the magazine if there were enough pages for it. So you've got a, a, like a double drop of all these awesome photographs that end up online and everyone sees them on Instagram and that's like another push. And not only does it help the magazine because you get further exposure, but it helps people that are coming up because you because they see the need for allowing a really prolific photographer space, but also someone who's starting up because their magazine caters for everyone. You've got certain magazines that will cater for like a certain click or a certain crowd. But for them, that's that's bring up an entire scene on every angle, which is incredibly important. I'm I'm really happy to see how well the companions doing, like, especially with like sidewalk disappearing, uh, yeah. kingpin being gone. You know, it's nice to see them really thriving. Actually, quite surprisingly, in like the modern day, where oh, you know, Prince dead and stuff like that. It's nice to see them actually doing quite well. I mean, I don't know if they're doing. But they're still around longer than I think yeah. a lot of people might have even expected. Yeah, and I think that they're, if you open up a magazine, it's so diverse as well. You've got, like, not only with, like, age, but gender. I mean, just everything. I don't want to be, like, to go into to, too deep here. But every way is broad. You, you look at the skateboarding they push, you've got people that do more kind of, like, abstract freestyle stuff or whatever and then you've got like an, a whole article on progression and like ups and downs of vert skateboarding and then you've got an article on like the skate shop and then like a, an industry section it, it's, it's so broad and it goes into the ups and downs of everything it's, it, it's not showing away from everything it, it tells you how it is it's very yeah. real I think that's why I think the name as well is quite good for that because it's just skateboarders it's not like a, a fresher which is kind of a certain sect of skateboarding you know it's just a very wide a name for everyone, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice. it. Yeah, so, and, and that kind of like it, it harks back to the way that Sidewalk was. Because like going back to prison, my first video, I did an edit before that came out, which was um, we had this warehouse that was an old clean easy warehouse that we used to build ramps for and, and build build ramps there. And I had an edit that I'd made in my like first year of uni or something, and I and I, I put it together and it was put on Sidewalk. And that was my first ever bit of recognition that I had as like an 18, 18 year old or something. And to me, that meant, that, that, that meant just an incredible amount. I, I couldn't describe to anyone what I was feeling there. But to have that as a young skate filmmaker, no one will take that feeling away from you. I was about to say, though, it must have felt like being on top of the world a little bit. Like the Absolutely. first video you get 
pushed by a big magazine like that. Yeah, and and to to know that people are paying attention, somehow they've picked that up. I, I, I when I was speaking to um, Jude, I think he had a really good head about it. It was like he's stoked that it's happened, like you know people like picking up on his videos and stuff. But he doesn't want to get. I can't remember exactly what he said. It was like he doesn't want to get too like overly hyped about it, just in case it stops. He what he wants to kind of keep it nice and mellow, which I think is a good way to go about it because you might be like, oh my god, I'm on this thing, you know, and then all of a sudden the next video doesn't do so well and. You know, I think it's good to keep a level head about that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But but his videos are great. Like the way yeah. that he he composes everything, and the way that it you can obviously tell that he's taken a massive influence from Al. Um, and Al's videos are just like gorgeous. And, and he's got a video on Grey, which I've never had a video on, video on Grey. I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> okay. but that, oh, that's, man. that's something to be incredibly proud of because obviously they're very very picky of their content. It's very um, curated. I would yeah, say. yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that his last video was was brilliant. Yeah, the soundtrack and the way that he, the way they worked that composed everything. Like it, it was like it was almost like the skateboarding was scored to that music. That's oh wow, that, wow. You know what that's I mean? Quite, that's quite a compliment, actually. Yeah. yeah, wow. I think you know you had McGee kind of do like kind of review of like drafts for you. Yeah, I think yeah. he had Al do that with him. Which that makes pretty, sense. That's yeah, pretty yeah, cool yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, that was really good. And it's nice to see like even like. The young generation, like Jude, getting help from like the not like old generation, but you know, Al's like kind of a more matured filmer, you know, and all that <laughs> stuff. And it's kind of the same with you, you know, you kind of the newer ge- generation to Dan and Kevin and all that kind of stuff. So it's cool to see that kind of open communication to like help each other out and make sure the edits come out as good as they can be. Yeah, that's it. And I think it's all about keeping those connections as well, because yes. you don't, you never, you never know when you might need help from someone in the future. I I think I first met Kev on the I don't know maybe 2000 I think it was 2014. Thrasher did a UK tour and they came to Dean Lane, and I met Kev at Dean Lane, and you know spoke to him for a little bit. It was one of those like, hey, how you doing? You know, we've been speaking to each other on like online for a bit, and then I think I was like, we met each other again once after that point. But from the decimal video, Callum was getting S shoes. He's gone travelling since, though I'm not sure what the, what the deal is with his hookup. But yeah, he's getting S from that. Yeah, Kev was just basically like, you're pushing. S through through Callum, so I get yeah. Kev helps me out with with shoes whenever I need it. So it's just like, and then with the videos, it's like all these things. Just keep connections and and just be, be friendly and, and nice to everyone. There you go. There's no, there's no reason to be uh, like hot standoffish. Exactly. You know, yeah. Like ideas and tips and whatever it might be, because it doesn't help anyone. No, not at all. Talking of like magazines and stuff, though, do you think video magazines could ever make like a comeback? You know, like a four one one or something. It's quite interesting you bring that up because I, I'm having a conversation with someone at the moment. I can't really say like who it is or what it, what it is at the moment because it's not even like in production properly yet. But but the right. idea is to have like sp- spoke like written words. I think it'll be some sort some sort of like publication form or whatever. But but to have QR codes alongside the book that then link you to edits. Ooh. So having that approach as like a a physical magazine, but also like a video magazine. But I'm not sure if video magazines could make a comeback purely because of the production costs. Because obviously, for one, you had VHS, and then there was another one, wasn't there? Like on video, on video, and then it was UKVM or something. Was yeah, there was a European one as well. Was that Puzzle? 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 Was, puzzle? Puzzle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Puzzle had one. Um, puzzle was like podcast, wasn't it? it was like iTunes or something. I think they did DVDs. I think they did. They? I think like in the 2000s. Yeah, I think in this day and age, I think people would be careful about money that they put into production of things but also i mean not to sound like from like an environmental standpoint is it worth producing all this stuff that might not even get used or appreciated that's a very good point yeah i mean the amount of plastics and whatnot that would go into making like a dvd and the case and stuff like that yeah i mean it it does make sense so not only could it probably not come back but it also shouldn't come back i think that if you if you combined it with a physical magazine or something maybe i don't know no one really does cover mounts these days at all but if it was like a cover mount alongside a uh, magazine or maybe like a web series that was limited to that that magazine or something with yeah cap- i don't know i don't know how exactly it would work but i think that maybe that would be the, the approach that makes sense like you see them still like they have like dvds like on the front or maybe tucked in somewhere maybe that could be a way of doing it yeah but also, I mean, like I'm talking to you right now on a on a MacBook 
that has no DVD drive. I mean, I've got a, I've got a, you know DVD drive downstairs. Yeah, you know, like a, a younger generation. How many times have they bought a DVD? I don't want to. I don't wanna admit it, but probably not often. <laughs> I I know it's easier to put them on the web, but I still have a thing for the physical. Yeah, you know, the, the yeah. tape and the DVD and whatnot. I hope it kind of. You know, vinyl's got to come back, tapes have got to come back. I hope maybe skateboarders start kind of really paying attention to it as well. Yeah. Like, like Lens Freeze coming out on Blu-ray. Amazing. I can I, I don't care how much it costs. I'm going to take a loan out <laughs> to buy that thing. I don't care. A Blu-ray skate video. I've been sulking about that for like two years at this point. I need it. Okay. So I, I don't yeah. care. And it's Lens, which is just an amazing series. It would probably cost you more in like shipping and customs than it with the physical oh, desk. Don't care. If I if I have to fly to Japan to pick the damn thing up, I will yeah. do it. It's just, I cannot let that slip through my bloody greasy little fingers. I got to get it. Got to yeah. get it. Regarding like HD, when it came about, you so you kind of start, you made your first video kind of when HD was kind of, getting into skateboarding yeah. around like kind of late 2000s or so when you eventually did move to hd what put you off doing the kind of the dollies the cranes and you know like b-roll and all that kind of stuff what made you stick to a skate focused video especially when like hd was had the kind of the you know the idea of hd was like all oh, this kind of hollywood production and stuff like that yeah I, and you kind of see that in the early flag don't you where it's where you, it's been treated as more like the b-roll shot or like the artistic shot or the time lapse stuff or whatever i think for me it was wanting to still emulate a style that i was familiar with that i grew up with but also when you think of when you go out and shoot skateboarding unless you've got permission to be somewhere it's very much a run and gun a gorilla style affair so to get a dolly shot whatever you just do the standard the the french thread the rolling long long lens or whatever yeah i'm not about to put my camera on a board and just like roll it along a fucking cobble <laughs> <laughs> and so, to, and, oh the amount of I've edits seen i've seen do that oh yeah, you know, yeah i think yeah it's more just to do with the the time constraints that you have when you shoot skateboarding also the spots as well nine times out of ten you haven't got the room for that yeah yeah and it, yeah, I think it's just more to do with yeah the, the time and not wanting to mess up me up because obviously with Dolly you need to have like a lead in time and, and a lead out time and you need to get everything framed perfectly and the, everything needs to be in sync. It's not like like on my day job where it's like you, you could you just go from as many texts as you need to till everyone gets it right and everyone is in the same sync. You haven't got that luxury. And if someone does the best trick they've ever done and they're not going to do it again and you mess that up, you probably won't work with them. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, I mean. I mean, do you like that sort of stuff? You know, like the kind of the high tech skate video, shall we say? You know, um, I think when I was younger, I felt like I needed to enjoy it. But looking back now, like as I got older and, uh, and looking back now, it doesn't really fit. And I don't. And I, I think unless it, you get a piece that's specifically in that style, like a shorter piece that's more like conceptual, or maybe like about a place or about an environment. Or specifically about one person, I don't really think it fits. Because skateboarding's got such an amount of energy to it. And a dolly and, and cranes and stuff, they're so precise and they take such an amount of time to get that right, the energy's gone. So you're not getting that like nothing spontaneous anymore. There's there's no um there's no real spark. It's all like it's very curated, we're gonna go here and we're gonna get this scene almost. Yeah. Whereas skateboarding it's not like that, and everyone knows that. You you go out and you meet someone and you you crawl around the streets and you find a spot and you think Let's get that. But at the same time, with how oversaturated the skateboard industry is with videos and stuff now and like web edits, is there not a, is there not room for stuff like that these days to kind of just change things up? Yeah, I suppose that you're 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 very right to bring that up actually. Because you if you look at I think it might not necessarily be down to the equipment you use, but maybe the approach you use or like the format. So like there was that Austin Gillette had a like a sixteen mil piece recently. Yeah. There was a PJ Lad thing that was all around Boston. Maybe there's like smaller pieces that have got an edge to them where it's like a where it's more about atmosphere and the feeling of going skateboarding. Or it's not like not a day in the life, but but it has that kind of that short we're in we're out. Yeah. Not too drawn out. That's it, yeah. I think I think that's fair. But at the same time it's like You've got all this new tech coming out, you know, like DJI have that Ronin 4D thing. That's like incredible. That's an incredible camera. And I assume eventually someone's going to buy it and make a goddamn edit with it, you know. So I love the VX 4x3, you know, that kind of rough and 
yeah just that whole aesthetic i love it and clearly people do because it's still being used but i do think that there, there's going to come a point where there's going to be like a ty evans too you know someone right. comes in and does something really quite different you know like for me the most significant thing in the last 10 years or so was like static four yeah static four where like the use mm-hmm. of sound and actually using kind of ambience in between the skating yeah, and stuff yeah. like that before then it was like it was just music and then the skate clips to actually have a bit of ambience to kind of build the world of like the skate video you know that you're watching i think Hmm. maybe sound is going to be the future like more attention put onto that instead of just like the vx fisheye music done you know yeah i hope so i mean i'm i'm again as much as i try and put an equal amount of effort into the sound and the visual sound as much as you want to give it uh, an even kill it it always kind of takes a little bit of a backseat when you're doing the post-production. And you always think, oh, it'd be nicer to, to develop that a bit more. But yeah, Pontus Alv was one person that was doing it as well. Yeah. In, and there was like, I think it was a Jake Johnson edit that he did, where there's a lot of really lovely like, sound design in that. But yeah, but also that takes, it's way more skill to do that and to to understand the world of sound than it is to do, do a visual. Yeah. So I think that, you, yeah, you're going to have someone that is more more like production focused maybe like would it benefit being like more of a team thing where you've got solely a filmer and then solely an editor who have because it's good to be good at both obviously but then obviously if you have more time put into editing you can leave the filmer make the more kind of on the day decisions and then the editor can spend more time kind of really fine tuning in spending more time like on the sound or whatever it might be you know do you think that could be something to consider yeah it could be i, I think there's i think it's deep dish like chicago videos they hmm. they already have that kind of that balance where they've got someone that goes out and shoots all the stuff and another guy that cuts it all and does, does all the posts and someone someone else that helps out with the motion graphics i, mean, I think even like back in the day with blueprint you had mcgee and chairs doing the filming and obviously morph as well and then mcgee was overseeing the post stuff I guess on slightly bigger projects, we get more people involved, then that would, that would, yeah, that will work. I mean, yeah, you bring up Static's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you've obviously got a lot of people that are collaborating with that. But obviously, Josh Stewart is the main workhorse in that, and he's been spending his entire life on one video. What? <laughs> Something like, was it? I think the first clip was like 2004, and it came out like 10 years later. It's amazing. Like, you just, I don't feel like you hear about that anymore, apart from, um, Whitlong's video, which he just did like five years or something. Yeah, yeah. Apart yeah, from that, it's it. usually like it's back to like early trans world where it's like six months to a year, and then the video's out. I know. I, I'm I'm sitting on some footage of Scott, which I shot in September or August or something last year. Basically, after I finished Corinium, I wanted to do a few like shorter edits with the decimal guys, and then after Corinium, I was like. I've really burnt these people out. And then, yeah, a few people, like, I mean, like, Scott and Ricky and a handful of others were still around and still up for filming. And a few people might moved away for uni and whatever else. So, yeah, there's a handful of, like, that original crew involved. And, yeah, we made a, an edit with Skateboarder's Companion. And then after that, I was like, right, let's do another one. And then said it's it's I think we've shot, like, five clips. And then I was like, yeah, by the way, I'm having a second child. So, like, deadline for this edit is uh, is March-ish. And we're February now, and I've I've not shot anything since um, October. No one shot any skateboarding since October, which which was like a campus decimal lock-in thing. Oh man! So, I mean, I yeah, I mean that's got like a few things going on. You've got the weather, you've got everyone's motivation. People just can't be bothered after Christmas. Yeah, whatever else. It, yeah, it's, there's a lot of things going on with that. I mean, I, I'd like to um even if it's like a mini lock or so, just something to do because. Yeah, as soon as I have my second child, I'm not going to be out for a while. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to just have one little last thing because I, I when um, before Vincent was born, I did an edit with Vague called Vin that was I I literally like did the export like the day that he was born or something. Like Bex was uh, at the hospital, and I was like, yeah, cool. That's the like the last trick I filmed with with Ryan, which Ryan Price, which was like a by forty in the bath work, and then um, I knew that that was like probably the last trick. Just did the export. Went back the next day to pick him up from the hospital. It was like up on bay. That is crazy. Wow. Yeah. That's quite so, sweet though, because you can show him in the future like, hey son, shake this yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your dad. <laughs> that actually brings me on to my next question, which is like, how do you balance being a father and a filmer? Yeah, that's, it 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 takes a lot of planning and kind of like calendar work 
but luckily a lot of the people that I surround myself with these days are parents or have like incredibly intense jobs like Andy Coleman he does a lot of building set work for films obviously Gaz Larry's Decimal he's got the shop and he's got his daughter Ed who's case for Decimal he's got all of his painting and he's got a son as well Scott Whitaker somehow managed to find manages to find time to be one of the best skateboarders that I know and run his own business as well wow yeah it, it, yeah, it, it takes a lot of like a textile WhatsApp group. I'm like, I am free these dates. Who else is free? And 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 to some people, they look at it and like, hang on a minute. If I, if I text them today and I'll be like, I'm free on like March the 21st, everyone's going to be like, oh, I can reply to that. Like, that's that's ages away. But obviously, some people are like, yeah, let's book it in and it's on calendars. Oh, we've got that booked in. And for me to have that booked in, I can say to Bex, um, I'm filming that day. <laughs> that's it. It's booked in. Yeah. So, yeah, and obviously it's like I need to find time for to to spend time with my family and and obviously like with having a kind of full time job as well in in film it's like the hours of that are never nine to half five like the hours are like an extension of that yeah so it's just like finding time where even if I've got a day booked in to go and film skateboarding if I've been on like a three week shoot I've just come off a three week shoot I don't want to go out and film a skate trick <laughs> I I'm sitting down. Yeah, I'm gonna have a beer. I'm gonna chill out. <laughs> I get that after like, not even like, never mind three weeks. After like a really like long day that may not have gone well, and like it's a four hour journey back to you know back to a, oh yeah our office, and I'm just like, do you know what? Maybe I won't go to the park tonight. <laughs> Maybe I'll have dinner and watch Star Wars or something. <laughs> right. That's, I don't. I'm, I'm only like in my mid twenties. I shouldn't be like that. But I'm just like I'm. All, I'm like an old man now. You know. I can't. I'm not as, you know, sparky as I used to be when I was like 16 or something. I was, oh yeah, let's do it, no matter what time or when. Oh, I miss it. Do you miss it? Quality, not quantity. Um, I think, I think back to when I was younger and I didn't know how good I had it. Like you, you think to yourself, like, oh, I'm so busy, and all that, you know. But it's like I had all the time in the world. But now I, I treasure my time a lot more now because it's so much more special. And when we do get a clip. And it's something that everyone's been really trying for. It makes it so much more special than being like, yeah, we're working on this video. Yeah, we've got these clips, got all these clips. It like all of that stuff doesn't have the same weight as this one clip. Like for example, this the clip I'm talking about with Scott is something we've been that we were trying to get for Corinium. And we tried for about a year and a half, two years to get it. And then we just went and got it recently. And wow. um I've just got I but I'm sitting on it. I don't just want to frivolously put it on Instagram or something. Because it means so much to both of us, maybe not much to him anymore. Because he just he's, he's said nonchalant with stuff. Like e- even the nose grind only back heel that he did in Gloucester on that ledge. Yeah. To me, I was like, I had so much, so much emotion when we when we shot that, because to us that's our, that's the love letter to Paul Carter. Like Paul Carter's one in the fifty fifty video. Mm. It was like the way I shot that. I wanted to emulate the way that that was filmed. Scott, the way he just did, the way he did that, it was so perfect. And for him, he's like. That was all right. That was okay. <laughs> but also, he did, he did nose grind nollie heel flip as well. He was like, yeah, just check that on Instagram or something. I was like, what? Yeah, hang on. I had this idea of like bookending the part in, in the daylight edit. We start with the nose grind nollie heel, end with the nose grind nollie back heel. It went on the gram and, you know, got forgotten about within seven minutes or something. That hurts. Yeah. That but that's hurts. what it's like. Yeah. I mean, how? what's the longest you've held onto a clip for? Probably whatever was in little paradise so you know about three years or something wow yes yeah i think that video took like two and a half three years but some of the footage in that was whilst i was filming the pixel stuff so between like 2012 and 2000 yeah so perfect blues came out 2012 little paradise is 2016 so within that four-year period yeah there's footage within there that maybe i don't know i forget maybe like on venture trips or something I was like holding on to, and I, I didn't tell Shiner about it. until now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was there various other things that happened within that time as well. Like I did some Red Bull stuff that was just very strange. I was going to ask you about that. Like I, it was a like lens folio or something like that. Yeah. So they put me on this. Yeah. The the, the article to go go alongside that. I had no no say in what was written, and they hold me in this like I think they call me like hardest working skate filmer in the UK. I was like hardest grafter. Man. Yeah, it's like, well, I'm not, I'm really not, and I don't <laughs> claim to be. And it was just like, a, it was a, that, see, that edit, 
I cut it in a way that I was quite happy with. And it had a completely, um, it, the, that was like my early experiment for the style of Little Paradise. And they were like, no, this is going to fly. This isn't going to work. So I was like, okay, well, well I've got all this stuff and, and uh, we're kind of like under a contract here. Like, it has to go through you. So what do I need to do? I'm like, well, we need to use our um, our music from the Red Bull music site, which obviously was just like the most disgusting stuff you've ever heard. And then it was cut in a very like European appealing way. Yeah. Uh, and they were like, you need to kind of emulate these style of videos. So like, uh, I forget what, they gave me a load of like Ty Evans references or whatever. So I got my friend Josh Perrett, who you know, used to work with quite a lot to shoot a load of hyperlapse stuff and whatever else. It's like all this shit we could just cram in to mm. make it be all a way that was stale and clinical and like had no soul whatsoever. Man. So have you watched that and you're like... I did watch it and I was like, this does feel a bit different. <laughs> to like Probably, the yeah, decimal yeah. video and yeah I was like a button monkey with that it was yes yeah, very much like oh that sucks yeah but I, I got yeah I got paid quite well for that but it's one of those things where you like was it worth it probably not I mean if you need the money I did I, yeah it was one of those things where I, I don't know I, I you know I had a full-time job at that time it was just like doing it and the, and the people that knew that it was going to be for Red Bull thing they were like okay all right well I guess we'll film the clip I mean a little little you know, it looked great on a CV. It's not on my CV. Oh, okay. <laughs> it might be on LinkedIn or something, I don't know, but yeah. Not worthy. No, it's not really. That is interesting, though, that they made you go back and, you know, yeah. Hollywood it up, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah, Did I didn't enjoy that process that much. But again, again, to go, to go back to our, our point earlier on about criticism and building and, and yeah. everything, that again was another learning curve of being very protective and careful of my footage. And where it ended up and what what i really wanted to do was more important than just not saying yeah i mean i i didn't didn't blindly say yes to it i did want to do it at the point in which they were like we like what you're doing do us a, a, a produce us a video that's of your style that's what i wanted to do that's what i came into that project wanting wanting but it didn't end up that way so yeah there's a lesson learned in, in everything really I feel like that's something that a lot of the new generation will learn, especially with like these big brands coming into skateboarding now. You know, they're going to have to learn how to deal with. Never mind like the skate shop owner or like the brand owner or whoever trying to like stick their fingers in. Oh, maybe you know, do that and all that. When you've got like a corporation with lots of money and you know lawyers, you know, if you try and do something that they don't want to do, you know, you, you're going to have to learn the hard way that you might just have to bite the bullet and give in just let them do what they yeah. need to do that's it and from the experience of doing like from learning skateboard filming up to like present day having worked with a few different brands the best thing you can do as a skateboard filmer is try and go into a production being close to the person who's producing it because like with the with the stuff i did for shiner back in the day like the venture stuff the shiny big pushes and pushes and whatever that was, I worked really, really closely with Jerome, who used to work at China, who now works at App Step. So every trip, Jerome was there. So you knew straight away what the vibe was, what the feeling was, and and the direction that it was all going in. And you can have a, a sit down at the end of the day and, and look at your footage and be like, yeah, this is cool. This is this is going the right way. Very, very similar to the Cyrus stuff that I was doing, the, the big push there. Like Matt and Simon Law, two of the loveliest people on the planet, yeah, that was, um, Osiris had a, like a little bit of a budgetary kick at that point, and then it died pretty soon after that. Yeah, they, they, I, I quite liked the style that they were pushing for that. Didn't work, and then it kind of all went to shit, and everyone quit, and, and whatever else. But, I mean, not that I'm a massive, like, Osiris fanboy, but I, I backed them fully, and the team was pretty cool. Like, uh, Alex Masotti, who was, who was on the, on the big push with us, he was the Brazilian Osiris guy. And he went on to skate for a workshop and Adidas and stuff. And like, he saw some really good stuff, really cool things. And I think it, it Osiris gave him like that. that Good stepping stone. But yeah, when you get stuff like Red Bull, it's, it's a bit of a whatever. But then, you know, you, you work with, with people like Decimal, whatever. And that's like a completely different world, isn't it? Yeah. I think also like with Red Bull, I mean, they've, I mean, they've been, they've been in skateboarding for a while, but when it comes to like, an adidas or something like that there's at least like skateboarders working there so they at least understand you know kind of how it works and you know 
the kind of the politics of everything. So I think it's a bit different when it comes to that sort of stuff, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if I'll get a message after this from the people at Red Bull being like, we've heard, we've heard this thing. Yeah. Talk, talk, get on us. Excuse me. Uh, what did you say about our video? I mean, your yeah. video? My video, yeah. It's, it's bollocks. There you go. If you were to give advice to someone coming up, I know this is like quite stereotypical, but like, what advice would you give them, like in the filming world? I I would find I'd watch a lot of stuff and find something that you align yourself with, whether it's like a a style or a, the look of a camera or the way that someone shot something. Not necessarily like bite it, but find the things that you really enjoy about that. And the things that inspire you and take cues from that and have your own spin on it because that will give you the the spark and the boost to do something yourself and then when you start doing more of that you'll find your own style and then you'll you'll figure out what you like to capture and then like i did you'll you'll like dabble in various different formats as time goes on as technology completely like continually evolves and throughout all of that like everyone always says, you'll meet great people, you'll learn a lot, you'll go to some brilliant places, and I'd, I'd say like, I'm, I've got quite a lot of. Um, it, I mean, I listen to like a, quite a few sp- like specific genres of music, but I definitely take influence from a lot of different musical sources from the people I'm around, and listen to the beats of music, listen to different styles, different genres, and like. When when the skateboarder comes to you and says, "I'd like this track on my part," and you listen to it and you think, "Like, why did they want that on their like in their part? What what's that track got on it that means so much to them?" And like, yeah, listen to beats, cut to beat, just like it, skateboarding is very rhythmic. Yeah, the the um, advice I'd give is just to listen. Yeah, be humble, and if you're going to be cool, be cool, and not colder. There you go. Yeah. Is it, yeah, well, yeah. When when I was growing up in, and getting into the the Bristol scene, you have people that, yeah. I mean, the skateboarding, yeah, it's it's very clicky. But you you soon le- you soon learn that there are people that love you and and have got your back, and then other people that of that are kind of using you as as as, as their stepping stone. They'll, they'll think of you as nothing more of like a, as a as a goal. Yeah, mm. which um, as a, as a filmer, sometimes you get those people, sometimes you don't. But then you get the people that want to stick with you and like what you do. So keep them close. That's really good advice. Yeah, really good advice, especially like to probably kind of protect yourself and your self worth and stuff kind of coming up. I think that's really important to know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I just I don't know why another techie question, but like, so you use Final Cut Pro mm-hmm. when yep. the world seems to be moving to Premiere Pro? Yeah, I do. What is it because you learned it in university, or is it just you you prefer it? Yeah, I um. So I when I started editing, I learned on. Final Cut 7. I was I was like the tail end of Final Cut 6 and then Final Cut Express and Final Cut HD and then Final Cut 7. And then I was using after uni use Premiere for ages and then Josh Perry who I mentioned earlier who did all, all the hip-hop stuff he was one of like the really early and um, like he, he loved Final Cut 10 Final Cut X when it first came out and I was very much like well I can see that it doesn't do all these things that people need it to do. And that I need it to do, so I'm not going to touch up with the barge pole. So I was, I was back in Premiere and Final Cut Seven, all this kind of stuff. And then I was working at a book publisher, doing all of their videos at that time. And they were very much like, "Oh, we can see this new stuff is coming out. Do you want to use it?" I was like, "No, no, no. We'll stay with Final Cut Seven. And then when I moved on to my next job, when I worked for that cancer journal, they were using Final Cut X, and that was at a stage where it was starting to get better. And I had to kind of learn everything. And when I started there, I started there in 2015. It was it was de- it was developing and evolving quite rapidly. And there were updates every month or so. And then I was kind of like, hang on a minute. This magnetic timeline and the way that the it works, like people people shit on it because it looks like iMovie. But the thing I like about it is that it's so simple. And it's like all you have to do is, is pull the drawers out and all of your technical stuff that you're used to is is it's all there. But it's just tidied up. So all the stuff you you immediately need to see, like your canvases and your timeline and your meters and all that kind of stuff, is all is all there. But all of the um, all, all of the deep dive effects and and transitions and like EQs and whatever else, it's all it's all in grading. It's all there. But 
for me, the, the draw to it I thought was really cool is the way that you can create scenes or sections as such and that everything sticks to each other. And then if you want to say move, if, if someone's like, let's put this in the context of skateboarding. So you've got um, your first part, your mid part, your last part. Let's say, for example, you've got your heart set on something over in the first part and then the middle part or whatever. And the guy in the middle is like absolutely killing it. And by the time you get to the end of the video, you're like, oh, I've put this in the middle, but it should go at the end. They should just just take it. And everything's still in sync. Everything snaps. And it's so easy and straightforward. And like all of the tools, they're very dynamic. And as time's gone on, the way that they have their, their coloring and the tracking and stuff, they've taken a lot of cues from Resolve and like the early color application that was in Final Cut 7 into Final Cut 10, which I think is really cool. So they've they've done the really good thing in current versions of actually listening to Edisol, incorporating all that in. They've jazzed up their interface a little bit, but it's in, it's essentially the same the same workflow, the same way it works. And it takes, yeah, I appreciate it's not for everyone at all. And it takes a, a little while to really get used to it. And yeah, I think that this simplification of it start with will put people off. But once you you figure out that you need to have it, you know, like a few screens and and everything's there, I think that editors that use Resolve would find it easy to to jump between. Maybe not maybe not Premiere, because Premiere is very much on the same level as Final Cut 7 in terms of interface and the way that everything works with the tracks and stuff. Uh, both of them just look like Avid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, another thing about Final Cut, I feel like I'm a massive, like, proper boy for Apple now. But um, <laughs> another thing that is, like, brilliant with like the, the the way that all these other applications you have to be so switched on in terms of codecs and formats and everything as long as it's the same aspect ratio roughly it doesn't really matter what the codec is you chuck it in your timeline and everything gets transcoded to ProRes for you so it's just like you don't need to worry about all of those things that used to be able to be, have to do with like uh, DSLR for example when H.264 was a really like difficult thing to work with buggy to transcode it to ProRes there's none of that yeah, so I think the only thing that people will still struggle with a bit is HEVC, uh, A4, H.265 or whatever. But, but then, then again, so to kind of like take a bit of a sidestep with my day job, some of the last stuff that I shot was all to do with uh, a group of people that are responsible for the codecs that we use every day, which like to me, it was just like, oh my God, I'm walking amongst like the superstars, like interviewing these people that I, like their work is just the, the most incredible thing to me. And they're so just like humble and everything. And, and yeah, they were, they were explaining that with H.265, it's because there were so many people involved in so many different companies that it is a really difficult codec to work with. So with H.264, it's much simpler. And it's been around since like 1994 or something. They've been working on that. And then, and then you've got like subsequent codecs that will be produced where they've learned from the way that H.265 and H.D. HEVC was created and they'll improve on that. It's like known stuff that no one's going to listen to. Oh no, trust yeah. me. I've yes, yeah, I think people will. I think people will appreciate it. But like talking of um, editing and stuff like that, is it H two dot six five? No, H dot two six five. There we go. Yeah, with stuff like that, you can always just convert it, can't you? And like make it into like ProRes or something like that to make it easy to edit. I, I I've got Final Cut on here, as you know, and I've been trying to kind of learn it, but it is quite different to. Because really yeah. I look at it, it's like all I can see is like an image, and I'm like, "Where's the audio?" And then you know, and it's like it is really quite a a steep learning curve if you've spent the last yeah, yeah, even just a few years on Premiere Pro or whatever. You can get it to look in the same way as your track. So if you um in the left hand side, if you hit index, and then I think it show audio lanes and show video lanes or something, you can have it come up in the same way that you would right. like tracks in Premiere or Final Cut Seven. But it still has the functionality of Final Cut 10. Okay. It does take... Yeah, I, mean, I started off just cutting interviews with it, and it took me a long time to be able to get my head around cutting anything else with it. Because I've yeah. seen... Two, yeah, box down interviews, like, pretty much just, like, spit and, you know, and spit it out. Talking of um, techie stuff, do you still have all your old cameras, or have you, like, sold them or something? I've got... I've only got the Blackmagic. I've got... Yeah, like various different stills cameras and stuff, but all of the um yeah, the Panasonics I sold. Sold one to Harry Dean, I sold one to Rybo, the filmer in Manchester. My HVX two hundred died 
my three of the X1000. So that was a, quite an interesting story. So after I finished Daylight, I was filming some stuff and then I bought one of those. I forget what, it, what which which model it was, but you know, like the record into like from Firewire into the, you know, like take. Oh, was it the Sony one or the Data Video? Data Video. Yeah, yeah. I bought one of those. And uh, yeah, I was using that and then I, I shot some stuff with it and then uh, trying to capture and was like, why is this not working? And then, yeah, Apple had like stopped all support for DV capture. And then at that moment, I had a message from Whitlock saying, I filmed a load of stuff for my video. Why is Premiere not working? And then we were both, both on the phone to each other, like Googling and, and trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And overnight, people had stopped DV support for capture. And we were like, Jesus Christ. So I went in a completely different direction and thought, okay, well, this is the kick up the arse that I need to um, to get the black magic. So yeah. I I basically traded, I'd sold three VX 1000s and my Mark One, traded in my old MacBook Pro, and with that amount of money, I bought the newest MacBook Pro at that time, pimped it out, and bought the and then bought the Pocket 6K because the wow. Mark One I got a ridiculous amount of money for. How much did um, you sell it for? Oh, I can't remember exactly. I, 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 I think I sold the Mark One for like nearly a grand or something. I sold that to to Rich Smith. That's so, nothing. Course, it, that is nothing I, these I know, days. But, but like what I bought it for, that's like nearly double whatever. But so all the new skate calf stuff is shot on my old Mark One. It's like a check me out. The I forget how much I sold, but I bought the the VXs for like hundred pounds each or something at the time, and yeah, I sold them for for quite a bit. And then Whitlock went in the other direction. And he bought in like a 2010 iMac with like that version of OS on it, so he uh, so he could capture all his stuff. At the button and still edit on his new MacBook. Yeah, he sounds like what I had to do not that long ago. Some that, that AGA box I bought. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I had to like I've burnt a copy of like Snow Leopard <laughs> onto a disc, d- dual booted it. It took like a week to figure out how to do it. Plugged it all in. And my hard drives aren't fast enough to capture from it. Right. Which is ridiculous. Because I've got a DV cam deck right there. Absolutely yeah. fine. But I can't I can't capture. And it's not even... Fi- it's like Fire, FireWire 800, and it does like its internal conversion to like ProRes. So you can put like SDI into it and stuff. It just can't do it. It's right. just too slow. So I'm just like, I've got this like 200 quid box that can't do anything. <laughs> it's like a sake. I, but I I still get messages from people about the, uh, oh, I, you know, I can't capture from a camera. I don't know, mate. It's like, you might have to just buy an old computer. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, that seems to be the option. Yeah. Unless you try and like pirate like the old version or like go to an old OS or something like that. But I guess, yeah. The I, old... I think, yeah, it depends on the OS as well, because obviously if you've got the, the codec support installed, it's not going to go back to DV. I still can't believe they would do that. No, I mean, I was thinking, to, like, I was chatting to my wife, and she, Bex, she was just like, well, what about all the people that have got all their, all their home childhood videos or whatever? Like, for example, with, with um, my granddad, he gave me a load of my old childhood stuff, and I recut it all. And, like, hours of stuff just cut it down to, like, 15 minutes of stuff. Yeah. Like, that's going to really hurt people if they've got all those memories. You have to I'm use those um, awful S-Video RCA capture boxes, probably. Yeah. Well, I did find one application that would that would capture, but but it wouldn't allow you to capture in like sections or segments or whatever. You had to do the whole thing. Doesn't really work, does it? Shall we move on to uh, questions I have received from Instagram? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. So I do know we got a couple, some from the homies. Oh, we've had a, okay, we've had a few more. Right. So we've got three from Al. Don't know who he is. Oh, probably cool. some guy. <laughs> Will there ever be a time when I can't find perfect blues on eBay? Is it on eBay? I I would assume so. Hang on a minute. I did not. <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> eBay. Hang on a minute. Let me have a look at this. What did they go for? Perfect blues. Uh, skate. I guess. Skate DVD. I can't see it. Maybe he's giving some fake news. I'm going to have a quick look as well. Unless, like... Brighton's got its own version of eBay that I don't know about. There's like a lot of anime stuff. Per- perfect blue anime. He could be fucking with us. Just to go stick on eBay. <laughs> oh, hang on, I never found it. No. Oh my god. It's like 20 quid. From Andy UK 70. Seven pounds 19 from Resale Wales. I'm trying to find it. Breaking Bad. That's not it. 
if you put perfect blue James Harris into eBay, as a yeah. couple, one is uh, one is pre-owned, conditioned, very good. Oh, there it is! Wow, Region Two DVD. Yep. Is that not weird to see? That's pretty strange. Yeah, yeah, that is a bit odd. It even comes with the booklet and everything. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious 20 pounds for that so I, I think oh the like... one I'm looking at is like 8 quid 20 quid yeah, oh there it is wow lit. yeah 20 quid that's hilarious just Amazing. above a copy of the secret diary of the call girl with Billy Piper yeah yeah <laughs> what a win wow. I don't know who's going to buy that I mean yeah man I mean it's at little... least it comes with free shipping you'd bloody hope so yeah exactly Andy UK 70 what are you doing 20 quid. No one's buying that, Andy. No, how, no, 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 no. how much was it when you? Um, I think it was six or eight pounds or something, I, I thought. Do you know sure. what you should do? You should message him. Hi, James Harris here. <laughs> <laughs> I made this bloody video. <laughs> I know you're trying to get a bloody profit on it. Yeah. Also, the date is wrong. I made that in 2012. That's, yeah. I think you should report it to Ofcom. That's hilarious, though. I it also, um, another tip is is that the reason why the price of that DVD was a bit higher is because for some reason I was pretty adamant on having a white case and not a black case, and that put the price up a bit by I don't know like twenty p or something. But obviously everything everything has a knock on effect. Yeah, I bumped up to whatever it was just because of the case. Because I've been like re really adamant. I was like, no, everything is a black case. I want it white. Hang on, one second. I just bought it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I bought the cheap one. I'm not buying it for 20 quid. It's got to be up. Oh, my God. Resale I now own those. the second Brand. only copy on eBay. But, I mean, look at if you... Right, so if you look at the, um, the, the sponsor list there as well, you just like... Again, that kind of just... That says to you how much of a mess it is because of the amount of sponsors that are on there. Mm. And the amount of people that I mean, like that were involved behind the scenes of that video, even though it says a film by James Harris, it wasn't really a film by me. It was a, it was like various different people have got their fingers in the pie, like various different Shiner brands. You have like Fabric. You've got. I know obviously it was distributed by Keen, so Keen helped the production, so they're a sponsor on it. Like India Cyrus and like Hayes Wheels and Landing. Like like Landing was a headwear company. Hayes is still going. Like uh, Bertrand that runs that is. Be a brilliant guy, but like a, a French wheel company involved in a little UK video it doesn't really make much sense to me. I mean, yeah, is that just because of like the guys in the video who were sponsored by them, or yeah, and also it's just like we touched on it a bit on Instagram, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll name drop. But yeah, having like Dave Wallace as like the driving force behind it, and I was just kind of like, I I got him with along along with him well at the time, and when we yeah, we we were quite close friends. But then, yeah, th it, it, yeah, everything could, like, took a sharp right turn in our friendship, and it just like got pretty messy towards the end of, the, of filming that video. And it was so far gone where everything was already in production. I was like, "Why? Well, yeah, I have to go with this mm. now." So yeah, hence why you got all the sponsors involved. That at the time of the production of it, didn't really have anything to do with it. Maybe you should buy the other copy to get it off of eBay. Yeah, take it out. Of, take it out of circulation. Yeah, I'll refresh it now. Yeah, well, I still got that one up there, even though you bought it. But yeah, it's just come to eight pounds eighty four. Oh. Should I send Dave a receipt? Yeah, you should. You can find it. <laughs> the guy that, I mean, yeah, yeah, right. I think we'll move on from that. Yeah, right. that's fair. So, Al's next question, actually relating to daylight. Oh, cool. So, the story behind Scott's nose grind nolly back heel in daylight. I think, I, yeah, I've kind of touched upon that, and that yeah. was um, the Paul Carter. Yeah, the Paul Carter homage to that. Um, again, it was it's a trick that Scott's always wanted to do, and shooting it like DV VX, it was really easy to emulate the way that the original was shot. But kind of like a, a behind the scenes story from that, it was absolutely bitterly cold. I remember having a cold and barely being able to like use my voice, and in the raw footage, you can hear me like, uh, it was like I can't, I can't speak, and um, it was just the two of us. Like, no one else was around. We went for a pint after and then just went home. Uh, and that was it. It was very much like, yeah, job done. Um, that that was like pretty early on into filming that edit as well. Like we did a few trips uh, filming for that. But yeah, obviously, or we, or, like, I knew straight away that that was the last trick. 
and yeah. it was just getting everything, everything else to fill that fill that but yeah um kind of another behind the scenes thing with with daylight is that all the music in that was um yeah stuff that i got permission to use and like and, and bands that i was pretty close with and um basically on youtube for whatever reason cobalt uh, licensing were on me really hard like i had some pretty heavy warnings on youtube being like yeah, you do one more thing and you're you're out of YouTube kind of thing. Uh, which in this day and age is really strange because you you all obviously have like the the adverts and on it and then like the tags for like listen to this track that you've got in this video. But basically, I saw a yeah you know, like the, the the first track is like kind of like a folky style stuff by the girl by a girl called Valley Maker. I went and saw him live uh, in Bristol a good few years ago, and um, I just asked him like I really like this track that you've that you played. I'm I'm making the skate film maybe can we work something out and he's like i used to skate as well gave me his email address and everything we just started talking like ended up with quite a few things in common and um he basically got in touch with cobalt uh sony or like french kiss and whoever else and was just like let james have a five-year contract on this track for free and then um billy leaker who's one of my oldest closest friends uh, he moved to australia and then came back for a bit and i went filming with him and i had a from indian lakes t-shirt on and like tagged from Indian Lakes on it. And Joey Venucci, who does From Indian Lakes, he commented on the post being like, make me a skate video. And I was immediately <laughs> like, okay, I'm hitting you up for music. And he was like, I've got this new album coming out. It's on my own label. Take whatever you want from it. And he used to skate as well. So again, it's nice. like all these connections that skateboarding has brought you. So um, yeah, I did a few edits with his music on it. And, and yeah, so all the music in that is like people that saw the video, supported it. And were like, yeah, let's have our music on it. But there was one band I really wanted music on it, and that was a, a band called No Mono, which are an Australian band. And the record label and the artists were like, yeah, we're keen for this, but we have to take a little bit of money from you on this. And I think we agreed on like £30, £50 or something. But then um, some like higher-ups at whatever record label were like, no, we need a grand. And then the guys were like, well, obviously James isn't going to give you that. Like This is an independent thing. Wow. And then that just never worked out. But... That's scummy. Yeah. But that's, I think that's um, that's pretty cool, though, to actually, like, instead of just nicking the music, actually going ahead and getting the permission. I think that's really important. Yeah, and it was nice for them to push it as well, and for them to, to see it on something that hadn't been, you know, like Vanny Maker's music videos are all these, like, really lovely um, environmental videos, and then Indian Lake stuff is all, like, is um, whatever, like, performance-based stuff. But, yeah, to have their stuff cut to skating skateboarding which hasn't been hadn't been done before was quite cool yeah like I've, I've used a lot of music from a guy called um whitey and he's had a, i think he's had a few songs actually in fully flared uh yeah, well, like yeah, yeah, I remember you saying that. yeah yeah and um he's like i've messaged him every time i was like yo can i use this in like just a little web edit with me major like, absolutely and you know he's absolutely yeah. sound with it and i was like yes yes fuck elton john and all that you know in like the million dollars to use a song or whatever go for the, like, the little indie bands they're always keen to get stuff out there and they're I usually willing that. to do it for free as well which is lovely yeah and and they see the the value it that support brings other people like as we all know a lot of the music that we are into some of it will have come from a skateboard video down the line and getting that exposure from someone that's that speaks volumes like the amount of albums that we must have bought just from a few tracks from I know, I know from like from um, experience from Lost and Found, and then also I mean from anything like from from film culture or whatever. Like music has a, a massive impact on us. So I think having some like humility is is important. He's got another one. Oh yeah, right. Al asks again. Story behind Scott Whitaker. Uh, sorry, Scott Whit Whitaker. Is it Whitaker? Whitaker, yeah. Scott Whitaker's double denim fit in <laughs> Caribbean. Oh my god! <laughs> so Al would would um constantly comment on stuff, or like just receive a message from me out the blue, commenting on the trousers. Like, <laughs> so I I would show Al like rough cuts of stuff, or like he he like when he was doing the um the Villagers series. Yeah, I think he went to like Devon and Western or something. And like I was, I was sending him footage of spots that I'd recommend him to go to. And then, yeah, it was a few clips of Scott. It's like, why is Scott wearing his girlfriend's jeans? And I'd be like, Leave, you know, let me be. <laughs> this is Scott. He, the thing is that Scott doesn't watch any skateboarding. He's, he's, he's like, he's, he loves it, but he's, he's 
not in tune with it at all. That's that's got nothing to do with his his like fashion sense at all. But I mean, like, it's just what he likes to wear. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to say like, oh, you can't wear the the Canadian tuxedo today, Scott. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but also, it looks great if you're not you know you're filming at night. Everyone always wears black. Yeah, and you just Scott's vanish. With this shining blue, he he stands out. I'm that's not gonna, true. And he no. um yeah he always wears he never wears black shoes as well. If you if you look at his shoes as well. I don't, I don't know. I think double denim's going to come back anyway. So I think, you know, I mean, I'm not necessarily fashion, like a fashionista, but he might be onto something, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was chatting to someone the other day and they were, they were saying like, oh, yeah, it was uh, yesterday, actually. He was going to come to this, like the set that we we're on filming. So I got my white Converse, blue jeans. He was like, I was going to wear a denim shirt, a jacket. I was like, what's wrong with that? He's like, oh, I've done double denim. No, it's a strong look. <laughs> <laughs> I saw an advert on on a bus stop uh, in town, and um, it was like, "Oh, double denim!" Like, you know, just someone like looking goofy wearing double denim. It's like, "Oh, fashion, like fashion disaster!" Or something. It's like, "No, it looks all right." You know, they, there's worse things you could wear. You know, yeah. if it makes you happy, just whatever. You know, exactly. It's just yeah. clothes at the end of the day. That's it. And you know, you're not going to tell someone off for wearing, uh, I don't know, a, a black jacket and black chinos. It's the same thing. Yeah. Well, not the same thing, but you know what I mean. Callum Croft asks, there top, he is. Fr- <laughs> top three memories from filming Corinium. Okay. Due to... This is really quite hard. I think one of them would be, there's a line that Ollie Trop does, where he does a 360 flip and then a front crook in Western. And I remember thinking to myself that the way he did that front crook was incredible. And I really hope that that's like an ASMR moment. And <laughs> my, when I was playing that back, it was like the way that it sounded on the ledge and everything. It was just amazing. My only gripe with it is I, I feel like I could have been closer to it. But he skates incredibly fast. And I, I'm like, he's massive. And I'm like two thirds of the height of him. So my little legs are like, come on. I think I did quite, yeah. That That's like a moment that is, that yeah, really good for me. Uh, yeah, quite got up there. And then um, another one would have been to name drop Callum. Uh, so the end trick in Corinium, the switch fronts I flip down the uh, big five block in Bath. Yeah, Callum, we we went to Bath one day, met up with Whitlock, and Whitlock was taking photos, and um, it was towards the end of the day. It was in the summer, and it was like, I don't know, six o'clock in the evening or something. We were like, yeah, we've got one more spot for you, Callum. You like to chuck yourself down big stuff? We're going to take you here. And he was like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And everyone was just like bullying him into doing it, and he... I think he did that trick within 11 or 12 tries, but every try up to that was like a board broke. He did the splits, like he, he ripped a hole in his t-shirt, all the blood was everywhere. And it was, a, he was just like, I could tell he wasn't enjoying it, but he was just putting himself through it all because he knew that this was something that meant a lot to Gaz and he really wanted to do it just for himself. And when he landed the bat, there's a clip at the, in, yeah, in the credits where I can like, in, in, at the end of that, the main like skate section yeah it cuts before everyone runs after him but like when it, in the credits where it that extends that end shot and everyone runs after him and scott's there like tears in his eyes like clapping him i'm like struggling to keep the camera steady because i'm just like in such joy for him it's like you could feel the electricity of everyone just like yeah. running giving him the biggest hugs everyone just it was just like one of those moments where you know again similar to scott's nose growing only back heel that's the end trick in the video not necessarily because of the trick itself but because of the moment and everyone that was in on there that day will know the reason why that's the end trick and then the third moment end rule moment this again kind of involves Callum it does involve Callum yeah there's a shot in the in the film where it was a, a, a DIY spot in in Strider's old like warehouse that I think Damien Hurst had something to do with and we and there was like concrete stuff built there and I, it was just like doing, like, your standard kind of like, everyone's warming up, I'll just shoot some B-roll. And I just set a tripod up, and the sun was like, shafts of light coming through. It was like winter light, so it was like, it was just perfect. And you had the 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 dust from the warehouse, the light and everything, just like, just gorgeous light. And the camera, I had it set on a high frame rate, and, and Cam just pushes past this pillar. It's just like pushing perfectly into the light. And wow. that moment, I was like, oh my God, that is gold. <laughs> that is just such a gorgeous shot. And I was, I'm just, I kept thinking to myself, if I can get shots like that, 
throughout making this video because that was quite early on. I was like, this should hopefully look quite good. And at that point, I I was really proud of what we were starting to make because that was quite, yeah, early on in the filming process. And then, yeah, to me, it was just like, I've, I'm really happy with this camera setup. I'm really happy with the people I'm with, the locations that we're choosing to shoot at. And yeah, just hope that we do Gaz proud with this film. And it was just a push. But that, like to me, again, it's like all the emotion in that shot. That camera paid for itself right there. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> that, oh man, I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's, it's like the golden hour, but like of subject almost, you know. It's exactly. just like perfect. Yeah. And, the, and in in that warehouse as well, I think that the daylight hours that we got was like from ele- from like ten till one or something. So that must have been uh, like eleven o'clock. Past that point, it was like pitch black in there. Wow. So that window of opportunity was so small, and it was just like perfect moment, perfect time. Yeah, that's like a one in a million, isn't it? So yeah, good. Yeah. Talking of, you mentioned um, ASMR actually, which I thought was quite interesting. Have you ever thought about like sticking a microphone, like a wireless mic, on like? on the board like just by the trucks and just getting some grind sounds and do like an asmr edit or something like i i kind of did something similar but it was with mark churchill it was something the rescue skate shop used to do like a year it was like a mini big push star thing that they did around um, portsmouth and southampton and stuff yeah i had a yeah radio mic hooked up to mark and it was just like chang whatever throughout the whole time yeah. and then again like with the board and stuff but i think the difficulty with that it was it was just like so distorted and like overly peaking all the time. I just couldn't like monitor the levels at the same time. Mm. Like all the inputs on the HVX and just trying to like balance it all. Just like it didn't work at all. Yeah. So I think if I was to do that, yeah, I'd have to spend a lot of time. Again, like it kind of like harken back to what we said about sound design and skate videos. You probably want someone dedicated to that. Yeah. Nice idea. Yeah. I I, I feel like for something like that, you'd need like a um, 32-bit audio recorder. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Just all that range, and then you wouldn't have to yeah. worry about it. I think that'd be kind of cool, though. Like, super close up, very detailed, but very quiet. Yeah. yeah that'd be yeah. quite nice. Next question from the homie, Lewis Royden. Any stories slash highlights from the Little Paradise video and premiere? First of all, the premiere of Little Paradise and the premiere of Corinium were exactly five years apart to the day. Wow. at the same cinema so to me i mean that in itself is like that means so much to me both on sundays as well and both yeah just like 28th of november uh but yeah highlights of little paradise um i think really getting to know all of the people in that video a lot more than i already did spending a lot of time with them was invaluable really and just like growing together as friends because they not only were we spending so much time together throughout making that video it was like they, they came to my wedding. Like we, we spent a lot of time together on on trips as well, like in and out of filming skateboarding. So I think, yeah, just like bonding with people and yeah, make, make yeah, I don't know, making a video like that was, um, again, for me personally, not writing wrongs that I'd had, but, you know, learning from past mistakes. So yeah, to have them involved in that journey, quite important to me. And then the premiere itself, I remember really, really wanting to do a speech at the start because I remember, it, yeah, at the time it meant so much to me. And I had, yeah, Ken and Joel from a third foot present me with the little paradise boards. Like they, they said they came in from Bristol and surprised me with that. Everyone from Sidewalk was there and the cinema. I think we had to do three showings because it was, yeah, every every screen was 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 sold out. So like all this support throughout the night, which just meant so much to me. And I just remember chicken, chicken, you know, and just, I just couldn't do it. I just got like jelly legs and I just sat there in the back row and I've regretted that ever since. Just like wanting to, to tell everyone how much it meant to me, them all being there and like sharing that, that evening with us. Cause, uh, making a skate video is, is for the premiere really. Like to get, to see everyone's reaction to all that work you put in. Yeah. That like 30 minutes or whatever it was. Yeah. That was, yeah. Some of the best moments of my life really. And the cube cinema in Bristol a lot of the people that work there are skateboarders and, and they really support the the way that we showcase our film so like obviously you go to any other cinema like the Bristol's finest video that was premiered at the watershed and they were like shut up you know we've got we've got bigger screenings next door you need to keep it down the cube is an independent they're fully there to see all the love and support that 
people have for for a product like that. Yeah, I can't imagine being told to shut up at Escape Premiere. Wow. Oh yeah, people get, got kicked out of their own video premiere. Yes, that's cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's some cold shit. Jesus, man. When you were premiering those, were you like having to pay for them, or could you like work something out? Yeah. So well, again, this is this is an amazing thing about the cube is that you can either choose to. It's, it's basically um, community cinema, and it's not for profit, and they have a kind of like a flat rate for independent filmmakers. So I, I think it's like three hundred pounds to hire the venue for the whole night. That's not so bad. That's the cinema, the bar, the beer garden, the lot, and you can either pay that upfront, or you can choose to charge tickets on the door, and if you go past 300 pounds then whatever is left is yours so with little paradise all of that money at the end of the night I just, you know spent buying everyone beers you know like, <laughs> to celebrate at the end of it and then with carinium gaz paid for the premiere but and art we were all for making it free a free event but <clears throat> unfortunately during that time it was like when covid was rearing its, its ugly head again and the cinema were like well we can only give you one screening of this. You can either have it half capacity or full capacity, and you need everyone to have lateral flows and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but we really need to make sure that you have the exact amount of people there. With one screening, we're like, gosh, this is such a... Like, the admin involved in this. Yeah. So Gaz had to have it on the website, have a pound a ticket, so that people would be like, oh, it's a quid. If I really want to go, I'm going to put my card details in. You know, it's a, it's a process that if you really want to go, you, you're going to get a ticket and i think it sold out in like 30 minutes or something wow. so i can say I, I remember i was in sorencester with my son on that day when the tickets went up and i went to the museum and i lost signal when i went to the museum like by the time you're going in the museum and coming out it sold out that's pretty good yeah then i went back to wow. the shop and was like oh, what's going on lewis also asks what made the decimal video so significant to him personally, and will there be another? Yeah, what well, I mean, it's so personal for me. It was just the met that it, it, meant, it meant it meant to gas really. Just wanting to make a video for sixteen years, uh, and that's finally making it happen. And including some of the people that had been running for the shop since the first day it opened, and also including the newer group in, of the team. That to me, making. Gaz happy and, and seeing what he always wanted to do come to life was like them, them in the world to me. And and making that with some of my closest friends and people that I've known since I started skateboarding. That was just like such a nice journey. And, and obviously like it, the the way that the video goes, you've got the, the, the footage that we shot for that film and then it goes back to the stuff that was shot in 2009 or whatever it was to, sh to show the the history of, of the skate shop and the town. And, and yeah, I think... It, incorporating that heritage into it was something that meant a lot to me as well and if there will be another one i'd very much like to do another one but as you know my yeah my second child's on the way so it would, yeah it would be fitting it around family time and and work time but i you know, I'd, I'd really like to do another one but again it's some of the people that were in carinium like ollie trot he doesn't skateboard anymore and you've got yeah a few other people that have gone off to uni and various other things and don't really skate much anymore. And people, I think, that might not necessarily be up for, for filming street stuff anymore. Like like Ed, Ed Russell in, in, in the video, he's he's been on Decimal since the beginning. Same with Tom Gill. And it's like they've got other stuff in their lives and, and you know, we all end up kind of like navigating our lives in, in different ways. So it's like, yeah, I don't want to include certain people, but it might not, might not happen. So... In short, I'd love to, but I'm not sure if it will happen. I'd like to say that there would definitely be shorter edits at some point. I'm not sure when, but that will be, yeah, on the web somewhere at some point. Is it not possible to, um, when your kid gets old enough, get him running like the second angle, you know? I suppose so. I think that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Father son bonding, like, oh, get the long lens, you know? Yeah. I've been thinking about this, like when... So I had, I had, Vin was born when I was 28. So when I'm 38, I'm, I'm 32 now. So when I'm 38, he'll be 10. It's like, maybe that's, yeah, maybe you could sit there, long lens, just, you know, just <laughs> zoom. <laughs> you. Instead of dad cam, it's kid cam. It's kid cam, yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be quite sweet, actually. That could be like a cool little edit right there. 
Yeah, we'll see. Although you're kind of limited in the spots you go to, you couldn't like hop fences and stuff, you know. Yeah, true. Like, oh, well, that's another thing as well. Being a dad, is that I I'm very very careful about what where I go and shoot now. It's like I can't be hopping over like into schools that much anymore at all. It's like, yeah, it's yeah, not that's not to fly. No. <laughs> um, so why are you here? The school shot. No, the school's open on Mondays. Like, ah, well, you know, you got no, a stair no, set. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but oh, but that's kind of like another funny thing about the decimal videos is that everyone is so uh, not old, but you know, like we're all in, like majority of us like late twenties, early thirties, mid thirties ish. People see you from afar, and they're ready to kick you out, and they come over all macho, and, and then when they get to you, they're like, oh, oh, sorry, um, you, you guys, you know, you, you got like bags under your eyes from no sleep from having children. You, you're all bearded, and you're clearly like dad bods. Uh, yeah, just. <laughs> <come on>. just <laughs> You're clearly not here to cause trouble. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, that's why I also think bringing the kid on the session as well, because they're not going to shout at the child. <laughs> you know, a 10-year-old is like, what are, you, what are you doing shouting at a child? Of course not. And then the dad, you're there, you know. So I think you could use that, that right. as a little bit of leverage for some yeah, spots. We'll oh, he loves skating. You know, it's, it's his favourite thing. You know, that kind of thing. Utilise that shit, you know. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Right. But, yeah, the thing is, obviously, being a parent, you, you, the way to get, not get, but you know, encourage your child to be maybe into something similar to you is to not push it. So if I say nothing about it, maybe that'll happen. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Instead of like forcing it. Yeah. 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 Next question. Well, actually, the last one we've received is from someone called Fix Up. Yeah. Dan Higginson. Favorite street spot to film in uh, Bristol or film at in Bristol? Oh, that's easy. So when I m mentioned earlier about yeah spots that you know going out hunting and and finding places that no one's filmed that before, hmm. there's a area in Bristol called Emerson's Green, which is kind of like a a little suburb where it's very sleepy. No one's really around there. It's it's quite residential. There's some schools and some pubs, and it's it's on like the the area of Bristol. It's basically a big ring road, like a lot of A roads and stuff. Not not really a lot going on, and it's a it's a science park. And it's essentially like a, a, a big plaza. And there's a, a bus stop, which is like a three-tiered bus stop, money pad thing. There's some granite benches. There's uh, gaps. There's wooden benches and stuff going around. But it's it's far out from town, so no one really goes there. But when we go on missions, we go there on weekends. You don't get kicked out. And I think I discovered that when I did the... Just before the Osiris Big Push. And yeah, I took the Osiris boys there. We, had, we lit it up with a generator at like three in the morning. That was like the first exposure of that spot. And it's just so easy to film there because there's so many angles you can get from that spot and it always looks cool. No matter the like where you film it. And yeah. and at night the um the edges of the plaza they've got these like strip lights. So it just looks cool at night, it looks cool in the day. Yeah, it's, it's a it's, really good spot. Oh, it's a good spot. And the floor is really smooth. Oh, added bonus. And uh, going back to the, the trick I said about Scott, um that I'm sitting on it was at that, at that spot. So he, yeah, utilizes like the drop down, drop down bit. And he, yeah. In Carinium, there's a line that he does where he kick flips up into the bus stop. There's a no slide to uh, switch 5.0 or like, yeah. Is it switch 5.0? I guess it'd be switch 5.0. He does one of those. Yeah. And then, he, yeah, he comes out from it. But but the one he does, in, he does a, a trick out of the grind. I mean, it's accurate enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's it. I haven't got any more questions, and that's all the stuff from Instagram. Is there anything you want to say or plug or whatever, you know? Yeah, I, I think just, like, thank you to everyone that has uh, watched my videos and, like, supported the stuff I've done over the years because I don't hold anything that I do in, in like, that much of a pedestal, and I'm not... Yeah, and like I said, I'm, I'm not, like, part of the Bristol scene that is more prolific and I'm just like trying to do my like, tech, have my own ache on it which kind of has meant that which kind of meant that I've um it's not really felt like a Bristol video not, not really felt like Bristol videos as such it's, it's almost felt like a bit of like a southwest broader scene and I've and I'd like to showcase people that are more unheard of names and and people that I I really get along with that is you know it Film with skateboarding is, is not just about the tricks for me, it's more like a personal friendship thing and, and yeah, showing progress in of spots and 
in environments and stuff like that. So yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone that's that has enjoyed my videos. And I'm sorry for Perfect Blues. <laughs> We're not getting past that. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't dress, if you know, if I don't dress that, then I'll be honest. I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Is it like? Is it that bad? It, it it's it's a mess because of all of the different people that are involved in it. And I, 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 I like the concept that was, it was like with that we came up, came up with quite early on, which was going to be like a, not, we couldn't, we couldn't quite get a lot of different areas of the UK involved, but it was, it was the, the idea was to get different filmers from different scenes to allow us to have some of their footage and cut a video with like showcase in different scenes and like different parts, whatever. So it was meant to film like a UK video, like a whole like UK based video. And I think that it was like a almost a bit of a love letter to the sidewalk video in a way. But it, yeah, it just didn't quite work because it didn't have the, the it, it wasn't all shot on the same cameras. It was all shot in different different styles. It was just a bit of a bit of a mess and it, and it jarred quite a lot. And the the visual like treatment of it wasn't something that I was very keen on at all. It's very like very bright. It almost has like a Toy Story feel to it, like Toy Story clouds and all that kind of thing. The an the animation yeah. and stuff, which was done by someone else, and I just like, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, at the time, I could have just put my foot down and said, "No, I'm not doing that at all." But yeah, it was just like all these sponsors were involved, and then you've got like other people on my shoulders being like, "This is what we're doing. This is you know, how it," and it just got like a bit too deep in it, and I I felt like I couldn't really say no to doing it. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a bit of a hodgepodge of stuff, and, and I, it doesn't really work from the, my like we touched on earlier with the with the with the VX audio. Like mm. to have, I like to have control over, over a lot of stuff, so that I know exactly when I when I'm shooting it, I've got the edit in mind. With that, I had no idea. No, I was just going to say, like like having the edit in mind is like vital. Yeah, no, I never had that with that video because I was shooting a bit of it and, and knowing, you know, I was also doing like the logist logistics of getting other filmers involved and, and whatever else. They, again, nice concept, but it just didn't, it didn't work. But yeah. again, like I said, it, on paper, it, it did well, but for me, it didn't, didn't like, it wasn't fulfilling for me. Yeah. But it's funny, like when, when you're plugging a video, you're like, when you're in that moment, you think, yeah, this is, this is going well. This is great. Like maybe my feelings weren't right after all. Maybe my gut wasn't right, but you, you know, a month or so passes and you think, no, I was right about that. Mm. This is another thing that, that everyone needs to consider is that the skateboard industry is completely broken when it comes to the way that people are treated and, and the payment you get from it. Like for, for example, when I, when I stopped doing the stuff for Shine, I was like gradually fizzled out from that. But I never got paid a penny. I was given product here and there, and knowing full well at that point, like having done the stuff for Shiner, when I came onto the scene, you're like you know how much things are worth. You know how much it's costing Shine to give you X amount of stuff. And you think, hang on a minute. We spent all that time. You're giving me a hundred pounds worth of stuff here. Yeah, th this might appear as though it's a big huge bulk of stuff but I'm being fobbed off so if you take the skateboarding element out of it let's say for example you were cutting a wedding video you wouldn't think twice about that hourly right at all but it's just because it's skateboarding just because we've been accustomed to the fact that well there's no money in skateboarding there is but you know it's it's off to the side somewhere else and it's not it's not fairly distributed and people are not it's not that their worth, it, their worth isn't isn't considered. It's just like been accustomed to think like a filmer will produce all that stuff for little to no money, but a photographer will definitely get their money from the from the magazine and the photo incentive and stuff. When you you think about it, like not to say that photography isn't at the same worth as filming because it is, but a photographer can shoot that sh that shot their editing time is a lot less than a filmmaker and yet they will get paid a lot more for it. Which is, I mean, kind of baffling in a way. Yeah, yeah it is. Actually, one last question before I uh, call it a day. 
Um, what do you think of the whole the whole four by three HD folk? Yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah I think I think it's a really nice take, really interesting take on the the way that we've grown up with skate films and that heritage of the four three, you know, the MK one, VX one look. I think it's really interesting in the way that people are doing really heavy research into certain cameras and the sensors and the correct lenses and like whether you need a Metabones adapter or whatever else to get it to work and to look that way. Yeah. I think it's genius because it is something that isn't immediately apparent that you could do. Yeah, I, I, I quite like the look of it. Has it tickled your fancy? It has, and I have thought about it. But again, it's just like that has got one specific use, and that is for skateboarding. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at cameras and thinking, okay, well, I could shoot skateboarding with that. I could shoot stuff for, for example, like my son growing up. I could shoot stuff, personal things that I, I don't know, I'm like might, might want to go and shoot, I don't know, like, like a nature piece or like a documentary piece or, for example, like all the music videos I do on, on the side as well. That needs to be quite versatile. Then you get into the realm of like, well, I guess 69 or like even like 185 or like, you know, whatever. More yeah. like cinema scope style stuff is yeah. going to be more appropriate for that than spending a load of money on something that is going to be more four three geared. I mean, could you not do that with the Black Magic though? With like one of those Mikey seven point five fish eyes, you know? Yeah, I guess you could. Although that's more like post work, isn't it? Because like actually, like you did that testing you with the HVX with like you new crop sides and yeah. yeah, 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 and you strobe like a uh, four three. Academy ratio, oh. like black bars on the on top of the foot. I still do that now. Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, yeah, because you can have the the guides, the frame guides, four three and a black magic. Mm. It has tickled my fancy. <laughs> but I'm not I sure. think I've just seen the the cogs go and say, oh maybe, yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah. But then again, it's just like, well, I'm not going to, I'm like not going to be shooting skateboarding for a lot of my time. Yeah, so it isn't worth that investment for for someone else. It is definitely someone that's shooting <laughs> skateboarding more than me. I'll have to let you know what I think of Perfect Blues. By the way, if they ship it out soon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> also, I, from a technical aspect, that yeah, like all all the the frame rates, the shutter speeds, the cameras that are used on that is so all over the place because it yeah, it's just like nothing's coherent. Um, and you can tell what I've shot, what what someone else has shot. It's just like I don't know. That could be like its own little um, mini educational video thing, like an essay into video management or something, you know, yeah. like pre-production. It's like what you need to do and what you shouldn't do. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll enjoy the video, but I mean, knowing how it was made and like from what you've told me about it, I think I'm going to have a bit of a salt in my mouth while watching that. Like, mm, yeah, I yeah. see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> like, but I, I, don't know, I don't know. Maybe it's like going to be one of the, Best videos I see from 2012. You know. so, do you know what? It'll probably be better than Pretty Sweet. Just saying it. You know, probably uh, better than Pretty Sweet. I don't know. I, I yeah, I, I'm not sure that's the case. The music on that film as well. That so the music is. Uh, I think it's all by skateboarders on that film as well. Like various different people that got in touch with us along the way of like of making that video. Offered their music, so it's all like UK based, but but everyone in those bands are skateboarders, um, so that's quite a, quite a nice touch. But also that means that some of it just doesn't work. Uh -huh. Some of the music just yeah, really it doesn't work. I'll have to say. Anyway, well, thank you for doing this, James. I do appreciate it. Anyway, I'm going to shoot. Thank you for doing this. Well, no, thanks for your time. It's been yeah, been really good. All right. My nerves are calmed. No, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> now we can do the interview. All right, I'm going to shoot. Cool. All the best. In a bit, man.